right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third international meeting on fair data visiting for Duchenne and other rare diseases. Hope you're all doing okay. My name is Susie Ann Bacon, and I will be your host for today. And before I hand it over to Navel Lullout for the official introduction, I would like to hand over, uh, I would like to run through some few netiquette, some internet rules. So the first is to please have your real name and affiliation on screen. And by doing that, you can change your name and affiliation by running over your name in the chat list. The second is because it's a Zoom webinar, we are asking you to ask your questions using the Q&A button. You can find this one if you hover over the taskbar below and you click on Q&A. Now, as you might already see, the meeting will be recorded and they will be shared with those who registered. Another thing that we would like to do is share a Mentimeter to get some information about you as a participant and your opinion and ideas about data. So there are three options for you to complete this Mentimeter. First is to scan the QR code on your phone that you see here on the left. The second one is to click the link in the chat that I will put there in a bit. And the third one is to head over to menti.com and add the code. And I will move on to the next slide and I will put the link in the chat. Now, Navel, I would like to hand it over for you for the welcome and the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this FAIR webinar is about raising additional awareness on FAIR and how we can make uh, health records and the container uh, of those records findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for humans and machines. So hopefully uh, today we will inspire you and uh, we will show you one live proof of concept of our very latest development and uh, so I will encourage you to participate in this webinar by sending us your questions and the answers to the Mentimeter. Um, now I would like to um, invite Elizabeth Room, uh, Chair of World Duchenne Organizations, to say a few words. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Navel. Um, so, uh, first of all, of course, welcome to everyone and everyone who has been on this journey with us for a while and some new people, but maybe I can take you back like in a few minutes, like how this all started, why FAIR is so important to us, to the rare disease community. A couple of years ago, we really were unhappy about the fact that the data of our children, or when you have a rare disease yourself, were everywhere and not optimal use. We were talking about real world evidence, real world data. We were trying to do better in care, but we did not have access to data. We knew they were there and they were all kept in silos because uh, a lot of people love to keep their arms around data. And so there were so many silos that did not communicate and we couldn't use the data. So I had heard about the personal health train. I heard about FAIR. So I asked uh, Barat Mons, who will, is here as well, like, what could we do? Could you help us to explain what can we as patients do to improve this situation? So then now I give the mic to uh, Baron because he can better tell than anyone else what he told us to do. Hello, am I unmuted now? <laughs> yes. Well, I, uh, Elizabeth, so good to see you again and so many other friends. Um, I don't think I told you what to do. <laughs> I think I mean, we were just getting very enthusiastic about the possibility to use findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data to make, uh, to open up this, uh, this whole thing that you just described as a silo. And I remember that I wrote this one pager for you, I think, let us use our data also as a screen, like we are not even allowed to use our own data. Uh, I think you came a long way, meanwhile, and uh, the fair story has been crazy anyway, because Mark is here, the first author. I think the paper is approaching 10,000 citations. It's totally crazy. Nowadays, I spend half of my time warning people against pseudo fair because it's such a hype term that everybody says I'm fair because I put a DOI on something. And uh, I think you were one of the organizations that picked it up very early and really made progress here. I'm very proud. So uh, yeah, I think uh, 
right now we are at the verge of a breakthrough. I spent all morning with uh, Madbox, Marco. Uh, you know, there's so many uh, organizations now that believe that completely distributed learning over data that are in personal health environments is the way to go. And the other breakthrough that that FAIR has helped is that people are no longer passive data donors. They can actually participate in the research that we can do on the data. So I'm extremely happy and proud that uh, things like we will see today came out of the FAIR journey. And it, it spreads all over the place from the police to, to you know, the media. Everyone has the same problem that we need to do distributed learning over uh, data that are personal and we have to do that GDPR compliant. So here I am very proud. I can only stay till two o'clock, unfortunately, because then I have to talk about another personal health training project, but very proud to be here and congratulations with all your progress. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listening to you, I think what was the your answer was kind of just do it, you know, like there is yeah. the, I, maybe that was the advice you gave us. And with the help of so many people who are here today, including you, but also others, everybody knows and will speak later, we were able to uh, get this kick started. And now with Navel, of course, but I give the microphone back to Navel as we have to keep our time really tight. Thank you very much both. Uh, in my excitement, I forgot to mention that uh, the participants need to, to complete the Mentimeter before uh, quarter to three, please, because then we will share the results um, uh, yeah, at that time. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to show you a, a video from Lizana. I'm Lizanne, uh, Lizanne Schreur. I'm from the Netherlands and I'm 22 years old and I'm a woman with Duchenne. Uh, I did give consent to share my data because I think it's so important that we can actually find people who are in the same boat. I would like to know more people who experience the same issues as I'm experiencing. And I just think it's important that no one feels alone, that they can actually share the data so they think like, oh, she's got this, so I can recognize that in my own day-to-day -day life. It's important to everyone who's been living with this, even parents, so they know, oh, my son or my daughter is not alone in this, so I'm not alone in this. Just again, I think people who are really the same as I am. It's one thing for a man to have Duchenne or a boy to have Duchenne. For women and girls, it can be a bit more challenging because we experience things that men don't experience. Many times you can actually see that women are very overlooked. What I like to say is we are a needle in a haystack in a needle in a haystack. So I would like to know like other women of my age, uh, maybe younger, maybe older, what their experience is. I think it would um, because some countries might be more advanced than others. I think there's not much knowledge about Duchenne as it is. I mean, it's growing now, obviously, because they're doing so much work for it. But I don't know, maybe in Germany it might not be as advanced as it is in the Netherlands, for example. For me as a person, it would be really important to know what other countries are doing so you can actually find more information about it than you might find in the country you'll actually live in. It sounds really promising. I think it's important to have a place to go to um, because I know how hard it can be. Even three years ago, no one really knew anything about women in this community. So I think if there's an interface, people will get to it sooner. And I think that's really amazing. You know, live in the moment. Don't think about the future. Don't think about the past because I, I'm stuck in the past as well. Like, oh, I used to be able to do this but maybe then I couldn't do things I can do now. Don't let that stop you from what you want to do with your life.
the Duchenne organization in the Netherlands um, is up until now the only organization that has worked on fair efforts. But I think, in my opinion, that's not enough um, because I want more organizations to join in on this journey so we can make a difference together. Unfortunately, Lizanne couldn't be with us today, but we've heard her, vo her, her words and we will make sure to add new uh, patient organizations to join, to join our efforts. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed it. And now I would like to give the floor to Marco, Marco Rose, who will introduce the, uh, well, who will uh, moderate the next session. Marco? Yes, thank you, uh, Mela. You can all hear and see me? Yes, this is great. Yes. Okay, just to test it. Um, so yeah, it's also for me, it's a great pleasure to to be here. And we have a, a, a session with uh, with some great speakers. And I think the, the, the session here is about about our fair journey. And uh, I've been particularly uh, uh, active myself in the in the rare disease community, several others here as well, of course, but also for the rare disease uh, community at large. And I think that's a uh, uh, history that actually dates back from almost the beginning of the, the FAIR principles, 2014, we had the Bring Your Own Data workshop, uh, the second one, I think, ever. <laughs> and that was in the rare disease field. And uh, Mark Wilson was also, was also there. And that, had, that actually had a direct, direct influence on, on, um, on the needs and the requirements that that, um, that are part of the, the FAIR principle. So there's a tight connection between FAIR principles and the rare disease community. Um, there was a question about testimonials. And, and I think what, what, has, what I would like to convey, and I've, I've said that it, at other panel sessions as well, is that for me, the, the, the main, the key term is actually patience. So if people ask how well is it going for FAIR, I would say it's, it's going extremely well. Um, but also compared to what my expectations are about how how fast culture change would go, because it's a it's a massive culture change that we're talking about. And uh, yeah, you you would guess that that's that that's maybe 10, 20 years um, at least to to take place. So compared to that timeline, what we've already achieved is is enormous. And, and not in the least by the, the big push of, uh, of patient organizations, uh, such as the Duchenne Patient Organization, and um, also sort of the smart influence there in, for instance, um, suggesting that we academics and data scientists need some guidance from good project managers. That's one of the highlights and one of the learning lessons. So I think I will leave it at, at that and then give the floor to the uh, to the other speakers in the in the session, maybe starting with uh, with Peter Brown. Okay, well, I have um, been on the same fair journey um, and led by Mark Barend, I think. Uh, I think Barend was really instrumental to get this whole fair movement going um, on a global scale. And he put so much effort into activating everyone. And it's actually, surprising that uh, this went, went so quickly. Um, on the other side, uh, and we see that um, being fair is one thing, but you are very much dependent on others becoming fair as well. And that's also uh, what I am seeing happening now, right? So we were quite on our own in our fair efforts initially, in particular in the Duchenne field. Uh, but today we will actually see that we are not alone anymore. And then you can really see the uh, benefit of becoming interoperable. So this is, I think, a, a landmark day, I would say, uh, because we, we see now for one of the first times the real benefits of uh, FAIR and interoperability. And uh, so I'm excited to look and uh, looking forward to this meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter Brown. Um, so the hell, who, I, who would I move to now? Uh, you can move to Mark. Mark, yes, please, Mark. There we go. Now I'm not muted. Uh, so my fair journey, um, 
I was trying to think of a story that would be sort of unique to me and not, not overly overlapping with other people. So I, I'm going to start with the, the question of how do I know if I'm fair or not? Um, because fair is a set of principles and machines have to find things and machines don't have intuition and they can't guess. And so very early in my fair journey, I, together with uh, co-panelist Eric and, and some other colleagues, started to create metrics. And we, we passed these metrics around as a questionnaire, but when I checked the answers from the people who were participating, I, I found that either they didn't understand the question or they misunderstood their own infrastructures. And I thought, well, this is, this is just not working. Um, people don't know if they're fair or not. Um, and then I thought, well, if fair is meant for machines, then the only way to assess fairness is to ask a machine to do it. And the, the question is, can a machine find a piece of information on its own? Uh, so I worked with uh, Michel de Montier at a, at a biohackathon in J Japan, and we started to design automatable metrics. Um, and then I completed the task on my own. I became a bit of a dictator, I have to say. Uh, and I said, you know, I will tell you what fair is. And I designed 22 tests that measured various aspects of fairness. And this became the first fully automated fair evaluator. Now I want to ask my co-panelist, Barand, how many fair evaluation systems do you think exist now? 14. More. 20. <laughs> More. <laughs> <laughs> 21 oh. as of yesterday 21 okay so we had, we had an extra two come online in the last week so the list keeps growing so fair evaluation is a real cottage industry people are having a great time with it uh, the problem is that all these evaluation systems are generating very different answers and that worries me a lot i, I find it i think it's very damaging to the reputation of fair and it leads to distrust um, so why do they generate different answers? And what I learned as I built this was that there are so many ways of being fair in the wild. Right? And the various tools that are measuring it follow different approaches and they're adding or skipping certain steps. And so we're, we're trying to now approach this problem by harmonizing an approach to fair data publication. And this is going to be a white paper that comes out soon from the EOSC Task Force on Fair Metrics. Uh, but it also highlights the need for governance. Um, so we need, I think, three stakeholders. We need fair experts, we need software developers, and we need domain experts to all work together to define what are the fair tests in the future uh, for various specific domains. So we've seen, for example, Eric and his initiatives with the fair implementation profiles beginning to get the basis of how different communities are doing this uh, in their own worlds. So we hope that at the end of my story, how do I know if I'm fair or not? We hope to have a way to answer that question that is trusted by everyone uh, and uh, and will help you to improve your own data sharing objectives. So that's that's my fair journey. But may I react with one uh, sentence, Mark? You were not at the Fair Digital Object Conference two weeks ago, but even there, I, I was. Oh, I wasn't physically there. No, no, no. no. But even yeah. there, there were people contesting that Fair was all about machines. That oh, was dear. new to them. Oh um, dear. <laughs> not to mention that some of them were co-authors of the paper, but anyway. <laughs> that is disappointing. Yeah. Anyway, that was just a small remark. So it's not that everyone agrees yet on FAIR, and still many of the misperceptions that it would be a standard, it's the same as open, it's not just for machines. There are pervasive misunderstandings, and I think this group has really got to the core of it because, you know, they, this is really FAIR. There is a lot of pseudo fair around because the publishers and the funders are now increasingly requesting fair, and then people call anything fair as long as they get their money. That's yeah. a that's a real issue at the moment. Yeah, and uh, well, I, I'm going over time now, but uh, we have another another paper coming out soon um, on the this approach to harmonization of of. Uh, fair publishing. One of the things we say is that people are, are just gaming the system. Right? They, they know how the tests work, and so they code to the tests, and that's that's not helping anybody. So I, I will stop. Sorry. Yeah, with, with, with that, I think that's a, a nice cue for, for Eric to uh, give his testimony. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is fun. This is such a nice uh, round of conversation to have, kind of re, re going back over these um, these developments, I would have to say in my own fair journey, you know, if I say it in a word, it, it's just satisfying. It's extremely satisfying to be a part of this initiative. 
because the uptake is so you know um, so appreciated, or you know it, the uptake is 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 huge, and and the whole effort is very much appreciated. It's not without its conflicts, and I think Byron already indicated there. But then you know it wouldn't be um, important and useful and groundbreaking if, if it didn't. Um, uh, I think ruffle some feathers along the way. Um, my my own fair journey. You know, I'm a biologist. I'm not particularly technical. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked with computers. I've done some programming, but uh, I'm really a biologist at heart. And my own fair journey started even before the fair principles, um, just because I was interested in data integration. I just wanted answers to questions that were beyond sort of the the ordinary experiment. But that meant data integration. Um, so I was working uh, in uh, at, at the LUMC with Barrand and Marco starting in 2009. We developed nano publications early on as a kind of, you know, we, we were anticipating FAIR. We were trying to build FAIR responses to data even before we, we knew what FAIR was. Uh, the Lorenz conference happened in 2014. The acronym came into being, the principles were published in 2016. And then in 2018, Go Fair as an initiative was launched uh, by three countries uh, in Europe. And uh, I've been working full time in that Go Fair initiative ever since, so since 2018. And it, for me, you know, given my personality, this has been the best job I've ever had. It's been completely lateral. Um, it's not project based, it's really a support and coordination role. And so I've really had the pleasure to work with broad spectrum of stakeholders and to develop very generic answers to difficult questions and fair. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, when the pandemic rolled around in 2020, um, we even had some, some additional projects that helped us to consolidate some of our learnings there. And, and I'll, I'll mention that in my presentation in a little bit. Um, maybe just one last thing to say is uh, echoing Marco's comment on, you know, we, the, the middle of a, a massive cultural change. What I can say is on my journey, I think every three to six months, there's a breakthrough, a, like a cultural conceptual breakthrough in the field. And it's just, you know, uh, it, it continues because so much needs to change and has to change. Um, but it's really wonderful to see the, the group um, like EJP and, and the Duchesne group that have committed themselves so closely to the FAIR principles and have really you know, pulled it off. So I'm very happy to be here and it's a lot of fun to talk about these things. Thanks. And not in the least by, by in the rare disease community, by, by smaller drivers like the Duchenne community. That's, uh, <laughs> I can add that to you. So, so now for the, for the final pitch by, uh, by Barrett, I think. Do, we need, do you need more from me? Not necessarily. You can also just go straight well, to the questions, I mean, and then, me, then I let can me, start with you. <laughs> let me say something uh, very personal. Then uh, I've always said that uh, collaboration, good collaboration, needs three elements: a common intellectual challenge, complementary expertise. I think we see that from you know the different uh, speakers so far. But the most important thing is personal liking. Otherwise, you will not stick together. And uh, I think that a lot of people in today that are in, and specifically also uh, Elizabeth, to me have become real friends. And that's the only way we can work together against people that even today are trying to water down fair to what it is not, or actually turn against it. So there is also a lot of uh, kingdom protection that goes all the way down to electronic health records to people that have other reasons to not like FAIR. Uh, so I, I have decided recently to use the last one and a half year of my working life, because then I retire, uh, to fully focus on groups like this one that really get it done. So I'm very proud to be part of this. Thank you, Byron. That's, uh, yeah, plus one, let's <laughs> say. So for the, for the question that I that I thought of for, for you for the for the for the for the panelist if you call it that is um, 
And then I would like to refer back to a presentation I saw by Phil Bourne, who's also one of the data scientists, the global ones who worked on the FAIR principles, helped establish it. He gave a presentation about culture change uh, at one of the conferences I was at, and it ended in democratization. More people being able to do stuff with something. In, this, in his example, it was photography. Um, they were talking about, about FAIR, so I thought I can couple this to uh, another thing I thought about is, is there perhaps low hanging fruit that we're missing in terms of data visiting? That's sort of the topic of today, data visiting. So what can you do with fair data? And then maybe what can patient organizations, patient representatives do with fair data that maybe even we miss and that is simply possible? Um, and that would lead to actually doing that by, by patient representatives, so a form of democratization. It's not just the hardcore scientists doing it or, or hardcore clinicians. So maybe starting with, with Peter Brown, what do you think is the, the, the low-hanging fruit that, that is really that patients and patient representatives would be able to make use of in a fair ecosystem? Yeah, so we heard the, the story in the video right and and, and here it was also the, the need was expressed for a kind of a social network uh, where people can share experiences this uh, on their diseases which is safer and, and also uh, in the end mindable uh, uh, safer than facebook and i think that's still the state of affairs that we're in now right so people exchange their experience and try to find information on facebook and I think, um, yeah, we should have technology that is as user friendly um, um, as uh, Facebook, but uh, has um, well the potential actually to to um, also be uh, become um, a vehicle for data sharing and data visiting. And um, well, um, I think that's also getting there. Yeah? So uh, I just talked to a colleague here at the Radboud University who is. Um, setting up uh, public hubs or and we know the solid pods and whatever there is is out there right now uh, so we need very user-friendly facebook-like tools uh, to be able to exchange uh, information and experience yeah so Peter Brown, can, I then, the... can i then uh, summarize that that basically fair also applies to individuals so also to people with a with a rare disease Yes. And that then with that, you can you can decide what is done with the data and you can perhaps even do something with that data, your own questions. And yes, get this is on. exactly the democratization process that you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so then uh, thank you, uh, Peter Brown. Uh, Mark, what is your take on uh, on this question? Actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to pass because the topic of this question is the topic of the demo. So I'll, I'll be giving a very sure. extensive yes. I'll be giving yes. a very extensive response to that in a minute. Yeah, thank you, Mark. You're very All right. right. <laughs> so then I'll move to Eric. Yeah, Marco, uh, could you please just uh, paraphrase the question again? So it, the, the the question is. Uh, what we what we perhaps are witnessing is that fair can enable democratization, yeah. so that data becomes not only only accessible or only usable for hardcore scientists, but also for for people living with a rare disease. Um, and then, how do you see that this democratization can take place? What would you recommend that the patient representatives should ask for or should be able to do? And maybe something that is already around the corner in your perspective. Yeah, indeed. So, you know, I think the um, uh, when when we think about fair data and we think about all the different kinds of data that are available, so everything from kind of the cutting edge research results and the new discoveries, all the way down to maybe new treatments and um, uh, information on social networks that can connect people and just exchange practical information. When you when you think about the uh, the heterogeneity and the complexity of that data integration process, I think what um, what would be especially uh, kind of you know novel for people and, and really something new would be some kind of query tool 
And it would look, I think, something like Google in its simplicity, but should be probably also um, you know, more fitted uh, to the Duchesne community and, and to, its, um, uh, to its particular interests. So for me, it's really, you know, what does it look like for an ordinary person to confront this world of fair data as opposed to internet pages like in Google, but really, you know, how do you interface as an ordinary person with that very complicated space of data? And I think um, just having access to that information to ordinary people is, is a prerequisite for any other discussions around the democratization of the data. Yeah, it's yeah, really got to be like readily available in in a way that we appreciate with Google searches. Yeah. yeah. So Eric, would, would you say then what you think is is a, sort of around the corner, is and something that we would incentivize patient representatives to to think about is what do they want to ask? What is the query language that they want to use for their type of question? Yeah. And that in, in principle we know that I think Mark will show it. There is a query language. That we use, but it's very, very geeky, but it is very powerful. So, in, in principle, I think I would agree with you that it's good for people to know that that exists, so that that you can we can now all focus on the questions rather than, for instance, getting getting the data is often something that people want and scares people. But we can all start thinking about the questions that we want to get asked. Right? That's the yeah. So, so I see, I see Baron has his hand up. I I think I know what what he might want to say, but. Um... What what I would just follow up with is um, a list of questions. I think is is really important for two reasons. One is that um, you will find that there are some questions, maybe some complicated questions, but but nonetheless some questions that are asked quite frequently, over and over and over again. And if you could sort of you know have those questions ready to go as kind of a single button or you know some some sort of simple access point then that would be great because you're going to see a lot of reuse of that one kind of query. Um, I think the other thing is that we have to help people understand what's possible now in terms of asking these questions. Um, uh, you know, I think when we, we always like to say that, you know, when, when Henry Ford asked uh, a farmer, what would he like? He said, yeah, I want a faster horse. You know, they, they, it's hard to think outside the box and say, you know, I want a new technology that um, can do something radically different. I think people need help to see what's possible. So maybe they need help formulating the kinds of questions that are now possible if data were made fair. So thank you. And, and with that, we move to Baran, who had his hand up. And Baran, you can also yeah, make so your, your, you can immediately follow with your, with your uh, answer to the question and the closing of this, uh, of this session. Because I think this we're already a little bit over time. Okay, so I'll try to be short. I think the most important thing is indeed to see the patient as a partner in research and not a passive data donor. And rather than having anything complicated, as you saw in the video, what I see all the time is that people have similar sort of questions. So FAQs, frequently asked questions by patients. Who has the same side effect? Who has blah, blah, blah. So what we are setting up, and actually I had a great meeting this morning with Medbox, but we will have the solid people, the Ivy Doe people, and all of them together soon here in Leiden to see what we already have and how we can consolidate this distributed learning over personal health data, GDPR compliant. And, um, you know, I, I really believe that an app store where we bring all the clever companies from IOTIX to Roseman Labs to CNEX and so on, who make very clever algorithms and do complicated stuff on data, but have a very simple interface. And the best example is the one we think for Lara, you know, put your drug here, put your side effect there, your target if you know it, that's all. And the whole thing will go automatic and give you an answer after visiting all health or I notes, for example, in the future. So we need to make it exceedingly simple for people to re-ask frequently asked questions to communicate because it's not only answering individual questions of patients, it should become a lively community of patients that communicate because I know Elizabeth will be one of the people that can testify that some scientific discoveries were made by the patient society people studying the data on their children, you know, in some clinical trials. 
it's not only the scientists. So we, you know, let's see the patient as our partner in research. And maybe can I, um, we, we then can move to, uh, to Eric. Eric, just a very quick question. Will you mention the, the talk project in your presentation? Yes, I will. Because I, I would like, because it's a nice bridge, because I think the, the talk environment is also an interface. And that's an interface between human beings. So you can ask your simple questions and then a human being will convert that into this complex uh, question. But yeah. that's maybe then a nice cue to uh, to Eric. And then uh, we're a bit over time. <laughs> Sorry for that. Thanks oh, a maybe, lot, Paul. Yeah, sure. Maybe I can make up some of that, that time. Um, uh, let me see if I can share my screen with you. Um, that should do it. Um, and unless there's a, a really a, an objection, I would like to kind of share my screen from the from the uh, non presentation mode. That can sometimes save uh, save some problems. Um, and also in the chat, I'm going to send you a link to my slides, so um, you can have uh, uh, those slides. If you see links in the slides that you want, you can get to them through that. Okay, so um, uh, Byron and I, uh, by the gracious invitation of Marco, uh, often present at the Rome Summer School on rare diseases. And um, uh, this last time in September, I think it was, uh, Navelle was there and uh, she asked me today to, um, to try and give an overview similar to what I did in the summer school, which had the title, how global open fair data are changing the world in practice. And as I mentioned already, I've, I've had this really wonderful circumstance to be involved in Go Fair, which means we really cover the broad spectrum of stakeholders. And this is um, not only academic and research groups, but it's private sector, it's government, um, it's regulations, and and of course, even you know, patient interest groups. So, it's been um, uh, um, you know a, a challenge to to try and absorb all the different issues involved with the different stakeholders, but then also to in in a role of support and coordination and go fair to try and find ways to um, to support these groups in their efforts to go fair. So, what I would like to present today is. Um, uh, Kind of a you know a view of uh, fair over time from the point of view of go fair from this very um, broad point of view, uh, and I will try to contrast that um, in, in later in the talk with this idea of, of data visiting still in a in a broad context. Um, but then I hopefully um, hope to position Mark so that he can tell us much more about the successes in um, in the Duchenne rare disease context. So uh, this story begins in 2014. I think we all know it. The Lorenz Center uh, had this very interesting meeting. Uh, and even from there, there was a broad spectrum of stakeholders at that meeting. By 2016, many of those people had formulated the FAIR principles and published them in Nature Scientific Data. By 2018, Go Fair as an initiative had been founded already beginning to anticipate that there would be um, kind of a, a, a crazy moment of implementation on these principles and that there would be a need for some kind of coordination that would help us to get to um, a coherent, widespread uh, use of, of fair implementations um, to really make it practical and global and useful. So the Go Fair Foundation, and the Go Fair Initiative, uh, started up um, by 2020. Like I say, you know, we sort of consolidated a lot of what we had learned in those first couple of years in what I what we now call the this three point verification framework, and I'll talk about that a little bit in in the next slides. Um, but the idea here is that uh, we we think this is a a nice way to communicate. In general, a verification process, um, technology independent. Um, this is not the only way to go fair or the, the best way to go fair, 
But I would argue that any verification process will more or less enter into these, these three elements. And so, you know, this is framed in, again, for a very broad stakeholder community, but we see at the same time, um, focus groups like rare diseases um, for, for uh, you know, uh, uh, rare diseases. And we see the um, organizations like FairMAP focused on, for example, material science that have also come up with um, really brilliant approaches to the verification needs that they have. Um, so to mention just a little bit about this three-point verification framework, um, because the FAIR principles have such an emphasis on machine actionable metadata, it's really fundamental to FAIR. Um, we knew that in GoFAIR, a lot of organizations, uh, or, or let's say, a, a, um, let, let's go right to the scientists. A lot of scientists and domains um, are themselves maybe not very aware of metadata or not very skilled at it. And even less so are they skilled at machine actionable metadata. So we knew there would be a need for a supportive workshop environment where we could take um, practicing domain communities and help them to craft fair metadata for the purposes of their verification. And the format of these workshops is pretty simple. We have domain experts, we bring them in uh, with their metadata experts who tend to have already some knowledge, skill, but also you know, solutions on hand. And together they will craft their metadata that represent their domain interests. And so primarily what we mean are they will create controlled vocabularies, um, metadata schema, and we try to you know, inform the reuse of existing resources as much as possible. So we, we try to re, we try to prevent the reinvention of the wheel in the workshops. And over time, um, at least in, in from the light in context in GoFair, we, we've had 22 metadata for machine workshops. And these are um, pretty well appreciated, I would say. Um, we have colleagues in Denmark and the US who are also now um, replicating this workshop format. But that's just the first step in this three-point verification process. Um, the metadata components that you create, the vocabularies, the schema, are really just a part of your overall FAIR implementation profile. And this, is, uh, this idea of a FIP is pretty straightforward. It's just going down through each of the FAIR principles and trying to state as explicitly as possible what are your technology choices and your implementation strategies for adhering to that principle? So, you know, the metadata principles are, are I2, F2, uh, R1.2. You know, this is where you would see the, the outputs of metadata for machine workshops. But we also need ways to orchestrate that metadata and data. So we need some idea of a, of a fair data point or an equivalent. Um, we need uh, licensing, we need qualified uh, semantics such that the machine can really uh, move seamlessly between data and metadata. Um, so we have also a workshop environment where we can help organizations, be they an established repository or just a, a group starting up from scratch, but we can help them to make some critical decisions on the FAIR implementation profile that's fit to their purpose. And with these FIPS, we can then compare and contrast the implementation profiles of different groups. And that's what I'm showing in the graph here. Uh, you know, we can see where implementation profiles are overlapping or where there might be gaps. And that gives us a, an intelligent way then to, to try and um, advance or optimize the verification of different groups. And then the third part of this is, you know, Having your resources is one thing, but but getting them live on the internet, getting them actively out there is is another thing. And this is the role, I would say, in general of of what we might call a fair data point. Um, the fair data point we think of more as a specification than as a as a tool or uh, an application. But I'm listing here different um, either companies or organizations uh, that are implementing to one degree or another, fair data point-like behaviors. And I'm, I'm referencing two very recent papers on the fair data point to, to know more. 
But together, you know, if you have your metadata and if your FAIR implementation profile can specify the kind of FAIR data point you need, then you, you really begin to have a complete package for your verification. Um, so this is also, this diagram here has also been pretty handy lately. Um, this really helps stakeholders to, to understand the path that they're on in verification. Um, it's an hourglass, kind of inspired from the hourglass architecture of the internet. The, the shape of the hourglass is meant to represent your freedom to operate. The, you know, the choices available to you when you want to implement in, in this data space. So at the top of the hourglass, you can create your, your data any way you want, any way that's fit to your domain practices. But we need that data ultimately to be fair. So there's some kind of verification process that gets you to, at the center of the hourglass, some sort of uniform, standardized, machine actionable information that that you want to um, that you want to be able to work with. From there, you can enter into in the bottom of the hourglass um, additional layers of what we call fair orchestration, and these are just uh, then mechanisms that put your fair data into operation. And that first layer is this fair data point, um, and we can go all the way to the bottom where we can do different kinds of data sharing, analytics, or even this idea of data visiting. And what's nice is that we see all kinds of technology emerging now at these different layers so that people have really um, a lot of choice in how to do this. Um, just a couple more slides and um, I can wrap it up, but the, uh, the idea here is that GoFair initiated a FAIR implementation profile using FAIR data points, in some cases using a, um, a platform called CDAR to capture metadata. Um, that FAIR implementation profile was then picked up by our implementation network, the Virus Outbreak Data Network, um, to develop uh, um, uh, a data visiting scenario in Africa. Some of those implementations were repurposed through the FIP by our uh, Dutch funders, Zone and Vey, um, with some modification to create uh, a FAIR implementation profile for a project called Trusted World of Corona. And then again, there was another modification to that FIP for a project called Incentive, which is um, a project about uh, vaccine uh, efficacy in uh, influenza research. And uh, just to kind of make the point here, you know, we can borrow the FAIR implementation profile from a COVID domain and by swapping out an identifier for SARS-CoV-2 and influenza, we can already repurpose that FAIR implementation profile largely for this different project. Um, so that's a very general approach that GoFair has taken to, to help facilitate FAIR uptake. But this idea of data visiting, I, I summarize it simply by saying that, you know, we, we can contrast it to data sharing in data sharing, I think the key idea is that you're copying data, you're making a physical copy. Um, the analysis will happen somewhere, so you, you have to transport the data. And then even if there's a license on there that says, you know, this is sensitive data, it must be destroyed after some period, um, the data is out of your control and you really don't know where it is. In contrast with data visiting, and this was very important for, for Vote on Africa, um, the data stay local. They are not copied, but rather than the analyses come to you and through the fair data point and through the rich metadata and access controls, um, uh, qualified queries can be allowed access to the appropriate data under those conditions. And I think that's uh, uh, what, what everybody recognizes now is a huge breakthrough in, in thinking made possible by FAIR. Um, I just wanted to highlight lots of other projects that I'm aware of in this data visiting space. Some of them quite mature, like the Swarm Learning and the Swiss Personal Health Network. Uh, Vote on Africa tomorrow, if you are available, we'll have um, a presentation on, on the status of their uh, implementations. But there's um, talk, see for yourself, there's lots of projects now in this space.
And in the interest of time, I will simply end with two slides here and say uh, what we've been talking about lately with Vodan, with Zonemve, with TWAP, if these groups are actually creating now what they think are fair data and metadata, then it should be the case that these um, networks should be interoperable and should be able to interconnect without a lot of human uh, intervention. So there's a kind of interoperability challenge that's emerging now. And I think um, uh, for the Duchesne and the rare disease groups, um, you will also have an opportunity to address this um, to the degree that your, your data networks are in fact fair we should see some kind of automatic interoperability with other groups that are doing the same. And I don't think it's so important in the first instance if that challenge is met, but it's certainly going to be a, a great learning curve for all of us. And with that, I would like to say thank you and farewell. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, our apologies for the uh, the issue with the Mentimeter, but uh, now uh, it should it should work. So if you could try, that would be great. I don't know if we could share the um, the uh, the details again, Suzanne. Yes, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think it's our turn. Uh, that's uh, Mark Wilkinson and I are sharing a presentation. Uh, Mark. Yes. I am under your control. Tell me when to click. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm just going to switch off my video because I seem to have issues as well. Um, so that was a very interesting presentation by Eric, um, but perhaps I, I heard data visiting uh, several times. And we are about to talk about data visiting um, that, it's, uh, that is possible now for the share data platform and others. Mark, can you just very briefly explain what do we mean by data visiting? Data visiting is uh, a, a situation where the machine is capable of understanding the data so well that you can send the machine to the data instead of sending the data to the machine. Right. And so we don't have to have a centralized place to do the analysis. We can distribute the analysis. The analytical tools can go inside of the protected space and they can operate autonomously because they can understand the fair data sufficiently to do that. And that's that's a very unique, uh, a, a very novel uh, innovation since since we started doing fair. So that's what data visiting is. Thank you very much. So you can click. OK. I'll go first because I thought um, I, I will put things in context because before we see the live uh, demo. So I will talk to you very briefly about the Duchenne data platform, which is a patient-led registry. Um, Mark. Um, so it's uh, we've built it in 2019 with interoperability in mind, and um, so patients store their data in private uh, lockers, and in JSON files, which helped considerably the uh, the uh, the achievement of reaching the status of fair towards the end of 2021. And this year, on the 1st of September, we've made an announcement that um yeah you can uh, you can okay. carry on that uh, we made an announcement that two fair registries the duchenne data platform the uh, ERN registry for all neuromuscular diseases ERN neuronmd achieved inter interoperability so that was a proof of concept a successful one and i will uh, i will let mark uh, demonstrate it but it was uh, quite um um, well, good work uh, with that happened with other collaborators. Now, to put this in context, uh, we uh, we're doing this not in isolation. We're doing it as part of an EU-funded project for ERN Neuron MD, where Duchenne Data Platform, as well as other uh, registries, DM Scope, SmartCare, and Cramp, they all need to be interoperable with this registry. And by the way, this registry was fair by design. And uh, this is 
the goal is to achieve uh, the infrastructure to uh, to make the federated queries possible. And here I like to use the analogy of climbing the highest mountains in Europe because this is not easy. Because as a first step, we step we had to build the registry in itself. Uh, the ERN registry, then we had we have to connect the four pilot registries with the registry, the main registry or registry hub. And finally, we need to invite the other HC, uh, HCPs across Europe, uh, I believe 84 across 25 countries to be interoperable with us. And the announcement that you saw earlier fits in this uh, well in this uh, climbing of uh, Mont Blanc. Now, um, the, the, this is a successful story because we have one patient-led registry and an ERN registry, both being fair and interoperable, or at least we demonstrated that was possible. And this is because, uh, backmark, this is because we've uh, used the same uh, standards uh, recommended by uh, the European Joint Programme on Rare Diseases on how to implement FAIR, the, the common data elements for rare diseases registries, and also the semantic models for data and metadata. But all of this, uh, it's wonderful, and we came a long way. However, uh, Mark will take over and tell you about the, the, the challenge that we have to overcome. Over to you, Mark. OK, thank you. So the challenge, uh, as I see it, is that uh, FAIR is intended to support discovery and reuse of data. Uh, but we cannot allow open access to the Duchenne parent projects and the Duchenne data platform for sensitive patient records. So what's the point? Right? What, what is the point of doing the FAIR transformation at all isn't FAIR about sharing. So what I want to show you in a, in a live demo is that we've now achieved privacy preserving integrated analytics via data visiting. Now I'm going to take you through how we did it and then I'll do the demo. So we're using a, a query technology, just a placeholder at the moment, uh, that connects a web address to a database query. It's called the Git Repository Linked Data Converter, which I've highly, highly modified to increase its security. And what it does it, is it will take predefined queries and put them inside of the protected space where they can then be executed in a protected area, right? And that's what we consider to be data visiting. The queries are approved by experts, so they expose no personally identifiable information at all. So this is what it looks like. There is a database, uh, the World Duchenne Organization GitHub, a database of fair queries, which have been vetted by me, by Noel, by other, other domain experts and uh, security experts and privacy experts. Uh, and those are then brought inside of the secure space. And this piece here is a website. And it's a website that can do exactly one thing. It can answer a single type of question, and that is, for example, how many patients in the registry are diagnosed with a particular disease based on its, uh, on its disease code. It retrieves a number and nothing else. So this is what it looks like in reality. This is the address of, of our accounting service. Then we say the type of disease that we're interested in is Orphanet 98896, which is the code for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We send that information in, it does the query, it sends back out a number, count 47, no personally identifiable information at all. So here in this graphic, we say we see that we called it twice. We called it once for Duchesne and once for Becker on the, on the Duchesne data platform. Okay, wonderful. But where's the sharing? Isn't FAIR all about sharing? Well, along comes Dagmar at EuroNMD, and she's watching what we're doing, and she says, I can do that too. And so she took the software modules that we had created and put in the public, and she put them in her secure space, and her secure space imported the FAIR queries, and uh, she set up her own little website. And sure enough, we were able to use exactly the same code to call our site and her site. And the reason it works is because both sites were fair. And so we could share exactly the same queries over multiple sites. So here we go. My mother warned me never ever do live demos, but I'm going to do it now. So I need to move by, there we go. 
<clears throat> All right. I'm going to stop this and okay. So this um, this environment that you're seeing now is called uh, Jupiter Notebook. This is the environment used by pretty much every data scientist you've ever met. And what it allows you to do is to put software into these boxes and then you click and it executes that software. So you see here it's saying thanks. So I'm going to set up the demo uh, I just did with bringing some libraries in. And now I'm going to call. This is a different demo. This is a phenotype count service. The question is, how frequently does a particular phenotype appear in each of the registries. So here are the two registries participating, the Duchesne Parent Project, and here is our URL, and then EuroNMD, and their URL. And if you want to play with us, you put in your URL right there. Everything else is automated. Right? So I now execute that code, and it will say data loaded successfully. Let me prove to you that this is real by just printing exactly what's coming back from that service. What you're getting is the code for the phenotype and a count of the number of times it appears in the registry. So there's no personally identifiable information at all, just a phenotype code and a count. So we run that again to clean up. There we go, load the data. Uh, so now I'm just going to do a quick bit of calculation, the total number of observations in each of the registries. We have to do that because eventually we're going to look at the relative numbers of observations for each phenotype in the different registries. Now we're going to look for the phenotypes that are shared in common between the two registries. So we do an intersection over every participating registry, and the ones that are in common are the ones that come out of that intersection. In addition, I want to show off a little bit because we're fair, we can reach out into the web to open fair data, and we can ask that open data to give us additional information about the things that we're looking at. So I can reach out to the National Cancer Institute thesaurus, the human phenotype ontology, anatomy ontologies, a mammalian phenotype ontology, symptom ontology, and all I do is I load their data, and then I extract using a language called Sparkle, which incidentally is exactly the same language that is in that shared repository folder that we're passing around between EuroNMD and, and DPP. It's the same language because we use the same language always with FAIR. I, in this case, I'm extracting the label. And so you'll see now that we're getting the labels for these phenotype terms. So we didn't have to output that from our service. Uh, we simply call it directly from the web. All right, now we're going to look at the frequencies for the shared phenotypes in the different registries. So the common phenotypes for the DPP, frequency 18, 14, 17, relative frequencies here. And then I can go into my analytics environment. I can set up data frames. I can set up tables. I can do, I can do for example, graphics. So here are the phenotype frequencies in each of the uh, registries. And then I can also look at the relative frequencies in each of the registries. And it all started with way up here. It all started with a URL. And that URL is linking to shared queries that are only able to be shared because we're both fair. So that was very successful. I'm pleased about that. So if you want to play, here's the address. And that button there will bring up this page. Sometimes it takes about two minutes to come up because it has to build. But uh, you, can, you can play yourself here. You can change the parameters and do whatever you wish. OK, so I screenshotted everything just in case the demo didn't work. So now I'm going to skip forward to the key points. OK. So the key points in this demo were the queries are designed by experts to be sure that they're privacy preserving. The queries are published in the open. So the World Chain Organization uh, query registry is public, which leads to transparency and trust. The queries themselves are run inside of a secure space. So we have security. No private data is exposed. There's no oversharing of data. 
becoming fair allows all registries to share the same query. And this is really important. Before fair, the different data sets, different databases had different structures, and you couldn't really be sure that you were asking exactly the same question in multiple locations. And so that led to quality control issues. But now we are asking exactly the same question over all of the registries. So we do know that the answers that come out are integratable. Um, any registry can set up this for themselves as Dagmar did. She set it up without any advice from me. So we're doing open science. And once it's been done, the use of the data can happen automatically, uh, bringing together answers from all the registries that are participating. So in the end, patients can be assured, A, that their data is being used. Right? They, the patients want this. They want their data to be used, but they want it to be used accurately and securely to answer important questions. So I, I think we're answering some fairly important things. And in the context of, of Lizanne, how do I find patients in the same boat as me? Well, the DPP already allows patients to access their own data. Well, with this, we could build an app that allows Lizanne to ask questions about herself, putting herself in context of many, many other patients uh, worldwide. Um, so her personal data in her personal space could be combined with anonymous data from patients in the same boat as her all over Europe and vice versa, by the way. Uh, and we're protecting her privacy and the privacy of all other patients at the same time. So back to Noel. Thank you very much, Mark. We are doing very well and we have one minute left. So I'll, I'll whiz through uh, my slides. It was just to say the, the success of all of this is of course Mark Wilkinson, but also others that worked with us like uh, Marco Rose and his team, Peter Brown at Horn and his team, uh, EJPRD. But um, what uh, the, the, the trust and flexibility that the Duchenne Brown project uh, provided for all these uh, the experts to, to get on with it and try um, things for us. And we're very happy that we choose that approach. And finally, the whole purpose, we would like to remind everyone that uh, with the uh, next slide, Mark, Sorry. that it's we're not there yet. It, these are important steps, but we need to ask more questions related to all uh, neuromuscular diseases um, to advance science, treatment, and awareness. So we need you. We uh, we need others to join us, um, Mark, <laughs> uh, to um, to join our work. Like Lizana uh, expressed in her video. We need more registries to join us in asking important questions. With this, I would like to thank you very much and thank all the collaborators that are working with, still working with us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. And so glad the the, uh, the demo worked as well. It did. Yes. Um, so please don't hesitate to um, ask us questions. We will try to answer them um, um, now. But uh, we move on to the uh, next uh, block of presentations where we will hear from patient organizations uh, like S SMA Europe, uh, Radiog. But we have now Eurodis, representation from Eurodis. Uh, Elena, you are, you are next. Maybe you can introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Noel. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elena. Uh, and today I will be uh, giving a brief presentation on, on behalf of Eurotis. It's a um, rare European rare disease organization and I'm working there as data director. And I'm very happy to, to be here with you and to also share the success of, um, of your great initiative, which uh, turns to be out bigger and bigger uh, with every step. So it's really, really nice to see. Um, and perhaps I will give you quite a, a different view, uh, maybe less technical, um, but a little bit wider and try to fit a fair initiative into, into the bigger context. Um, so here I have some slides to, to support what I'm going to say. So um, there are more than 6,000 um, of uh, different kinds of rare diseases. Yelena, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we can uh -huh. still see, we don't have your presentation yet in presentation mode. No, that's weird because I do have it on my screen in the presentation mode. Uh, let me check what to do. 
it might be that you have two screens. So in the top left corner, the, you can then switch on presenter mode. Let me switch off. If you go, if you click on display settings, top left mm -hmm. corner. Ah, there you go. This is great. It worked Thank you. now. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it was in my other screen. <laughs> yeah. So now all good, right? You can you can see. So there are more than 6,000 of uh, different kind of rare diseases and they affect uh, more than 30 million people in Europe. And only 6% of all rare diseases um, have curative treatment. So the number is really, really small. Um, and of course, um, these statistics emphasize the great, great need of um, access to data data sharing and also reuse of data because there are uh, lots of unmet research needs and also there are um, perhaps some undiscovered rare diseases and it's very difficult to say the exact number of affected pe people because some people are still not diagnosed so um in fact it, it, it is a public uh, health need and uh, uh, now in the last years and it somehow got facilitated but by COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there is more and more recognition of the value of data for health research. And there are there is a number of um, different types of initiatives and going to, to find the way to, to grasp that potential. One of the big ones, and you're going to hear about it later today, is the European Health Data Space. So it's an initiative launched by the by the European Union, it's a law which um, um, which goal is to um, to use uh, health data but to increase the uses of it both for primary purposes, meaning patient to doctor, and also for secondary uses uh, for research, for um, innovation, for policy making, for statistical purposes, and so on and so forth. So um, the, there are many technological advancement, of course, but also many legal ones ongoing at the moment. So hopefully in some years, we will see fruits of, uh, of that work. Um, so um, it goes both ways, actually. So it's not only the need to share the data, but also, as you can see from the survey, which was uh, uh, taken by Eurotis a couple of years ago, um, the majority of uh, people affecting uh, by rare diseases want to share their data uh, for a variety of purposes, of course, to know more about their condition, to develop new treatments, to improve diagnosis, to, to receive better care, to improve research. Um, of course, this number is not absolute. There are some nuances so that people are much more willing to share data with their healthcare provider rather than uh, an industry or even the government sometimes in some cases. So these numbers are just to show the the idea that uh, patients do want to share the data, but also it comes with certain conditions um, such as uh, safe sharing of data, respectful sharing of data, ethical uh, sharing of data, and so on and so forth. So since the situation is the following, what do we need to move forward? So uh, there are many movements ongoing, as I mentioned, um, in that direction. Uh, but one of the key obstacles for now is to agree on um, the legal uh, framework for secondary health data uses. So uh, today already uh, the general data protection regulation was mentioned. And in, in fact, yes, it is the main law which uh, regulates um, all types of data, including health data, what to do with that. And uh, but at the same time, um, countries uh, in the EU still have a lot of powers um, to decide and to organize uh, healthcare at the national level, to organize research at the national level. So it actually has an effect on um, the GDPR provisions and any other legal provisions too, simply because it's the country's competence. So at the EU level, we do have for the moment a situation where uh, there is a variety of rules and it creates certain obstacles for the cross-country uh, research, which is crucial, of course, for rare diseases because the data is taken from the variety of sources. So figuring out and agreeing on common rules is uh, one of the most needed steps in the near future to advance data sharing. Uh, another important thing 
is to advance digital health literacy, not only among patients, but also among healthcare professionals, among policymakers, among all the stakeholders which are involved in uh, data ecosystems, because um, we're still not there, especially when we're looking at different um, communities in different countries. Um, the level can be really, really high as in, uh, in our meeting today, perhaps, but uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's not really there. So in order for, for different types of groups to enjoy the benefits of data sharing and in fact to, to understand it in a much better way, there is a huge need to uh, not only increase the digital literacy, not digital skills, but I specifically want to use the term digital health literacy, meaning specific to, to health condition, because it is much more sensitive, it, it has different implications than um, any other types of data, so we need much, much more education and investment in the, in the education in different levels for everybody to understand it much more. And of course, uh, I should also emphasize that it should not be expected from a patient or from the doctor to suddenly become data scientists and to figure out everything on their own. No, I think there is a huge need also to, to have a new professions, perhaps specific um, uh, IT professionals, data scientists who would work in the hospitals, uh, within healthcare settings, and be a bridge between the technology and the users, meaning patients and doctors. So there is a huge need to advance that. Uh, it is also very important to encourage um, patient participation in different types of uh, structures, and a lot of new structures will be appearing thanks to uh, the new legal advancement. So there will be new governmental bodies dedicated to um, specifically management of health data. Uh, there will be new entities. So the more uh, facilities would be created for that reason, the more um, different types of authorities will appear too. So we would want to see patients uh, being part of this um, um, entities, authorities, whatever it is, um, because nobody knows best um, as a user what is happening on the ground and nobody um, can uh, bring that experience known to, um, to all these governance systems. So these are three uh, key points which I wanted to bring up today. And uh, yeah, my time is off. So thank you so much for uh, for your attention for this 10 minutes. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, I think there will be time for that in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, we're going to give the floor now to Monse, Monse Orbina from Radi Org. Yes. Monse. Hello. Um, yes, indeed, I am Monte. I'm representing Radiorg, but I do work for a FAPA uh, patient organization. So I will present. Um, so, do you see the presentation? Yep, it's, we do. Yeah? It's okay. Great. So, okay, I'm going to tell you about um, the perspective of Radio of Belgium and a typical Belgian situation. So just to inform you, in Belgium, we have three communities, the Flemish, the French, and the German. Uh, in total, we have eight ministers of health. And if you look at healthcare and reimbursement, uh, that's a federal matter. But when we look at prevention, that's a community matter. So keep that in mind for later. It's a um, um, very complex situation. Now, if we look in Orphanet, we find for Belgium 20 rare disease registries, of which four are managed by the federal institution called Cienzano. Uh, 14 of them are managed by University of Hospitals and two by a patient organization. And well, those two uh, registries are the uh, familial polyposis registry and the Lynch syndrome registry, which are managed by FAPA, the uh, organization I'm working in. 
So um, uh, both diseases are hereditary colorectal cancer predisposing uh, diseases. And it started in 1998 for FAP and uh, the Lynch syndrome registry was created in 2011. Now, after um, going to a summer course and learning about FAIR um, uh, registries and FAIR data, we always kept in mind the idea of we really need to do something with this. It's important. Huh? So we participated in the um, Rare Disease Go FAIR Patient Network Group and then we decided to start to a first step, make a very detailed definition of our data collections for both registries. Now, I have to tell you also that since 1998, our funding came mainly from um, the Belgian Foundation Against Cancer. And then suddenly in 2021, well, we heard that uh, they will, would stop the funding and that we needed to collaborate with, other, uh, with others. So we said, okay, what should we do? Let's, uh, we need to look for new partners, maybe to host the registry somewhere else. And let's contact other patient organizations which had similar situations. So if we go back to those four uh, registries managed by the Federal uh, Institute Cienzano. We see that there is uh, the big rare disease registry, but then there's also the uh, neuromuscular disease registry, uh, cystic fibrosis and hemophilia registries. And those three were uh, hosted by a university or hospital, which came in kind of the same situation as we are, are now. And then they started um, a collaboration with uh, Cienzano and the registries were um, 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 transferred from um, the hospital or, or, or university to Cienzano. Uh, and those three are still collaborating with a separate patient organization, a very close collaboration. And so we thought that's what we need. Okay. Of course, for the patient organizations, well, when we talk to them and when we talk to any patient organization in Europe or somewhere else in the world, we have kind of the same problems. It's funding. It's very difficult to find volunteers. There are very high requirements evolving all the time. Uh, GDPR regulations, it's getting very complicated. And um, so I will come back to the part of the patient organization because those problems still remain. But if we just focus on the registry, okay, so the decision has been made. We are going to transfer the patient registries to Cienzano. Now, if we look in Cienzano, uh, it's a federal institution. They have a, a fair data project and I took some uh, print screens of the website. So you can see, you can search by ICD-10 chapter uh, for the different data sets of the different registries. Uh, I just opened one for the Belgian Neuromuscular Disease Registry where you can see that you can download all the, uh, the data sets, the metadata and so on. So we still have to look at it in detail because um, we are not sure it's completely a fair, uh, how fair is meant, like mentioned before. So if someone knows it, please <laughs> uh, contact me. Uh, but okay, but we are kind of reassured in that way. 
So for the rest, well, the patient organization, uh, after the outsourcing of the registries, of course, we, we want to continue with our tasks of informing patients, families, and healthcare providers. Um, we also want to continue to use the uh, data of the registries for research projects, but also to promote the use of the data. And we want our member, the members, uh, uh, specialists, but also patients to take part into the advisory board of uh, the medical or scientific advisory board of this new registries. And of course, uh, we want to continue to do some psychosocial projects with data, which is not available in the registries. And that can be uh, something very uh, interesting to combine with the uh, uh, data in the registries. So uh, let's go back to the financial. You remember that we have the federal and the communitary um, um, budgets, and it's not always very clear, are we dealing with um, prevention or not? Because of course, our patients have a predisposition which means that they don't uh, um, have always cancer because we, we are trying to prevent um, that they have, that they would have cancer, but uh, it's, um, it's sometimes they are like uh, punished because you don't have the, the label of cancer patient. So is it prevention? Is it just regular healthcare? It's very difficult to obtain any financing. But lucky for us, there was a group request uh, led by Radiorg, um, VPP, the Flemish patient um, uh, representative um, organization, and then the Walloon. Um, Lus, eh? <laughs> so they were asking for a structural funding by the Belgian gov uh, government. Well, um, the first reaction was very positive. Like, it's really needed. You're all doing very good work. But then came a second answer, like, OK, you have to improve the collaboration between the different patient organizations seems very okay to do but then they said like you have to prove that your professionalism so it's very difficult um, to be more professional if you don't have additional funding but Anyway, we are working on it and we are very thankful to the three organizations to help us uh, in that. And we really hope that it will come to a good end for all patient organizations in Belgium. So it's an ongoing project. Monse, I'm yes? sorry to interrupt. I'm just being for the time. Um, do you have like one or two minutes to wrap it up? That would be great. Yeah, then we can move forward. Indeed. It's Thank you. The last uh, last two slides. So about the verification project, uh, it um, it's the last slide. So I will round up. Um, so it was very useful that we started because we had this detailed uh, uh, data um, definition. So we had the metadata. Uh, it, it's very useful to help with the requirements for the new data providers. And especially if we are thinking into a system to system data transfer, standardization, we can use it to um, um, uh, see how we can reach this, uh, these goals. Um, and um, of course, it, it's uh, uh, also very useful to review the variables that we are collecting um, for the moment uh, versus the new data collection. So in the past, we had this idea of let's collect all the data, all specialists were uh, 
interested in everything. But now that we know that we can go back to the uh, original data in the hospitals, um, we want to travel light and we say, okay, we will collect only the um, um, necessary uh, variables. And if needed, we can go back to the source of the data. So that was it to round up. Um, I hope it gave you a, a view of a, a complex Belgium situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monse. Um, so the next speaker is Nicole Gasset from SMA Europe, but unfortunately she couldn't be with us, but she did send us a recording. So Suzanne will play her um, a video. Thank you, Suzanne. Dear participants of today's exciting event, dear members of World to Shen and the Fair du Shen project, thank you for inviting us to be partners in this exciting journey that you rightly stress can only be taken with others. Unfortunately, I cannot be here with you today, but I'm deeply committed to advance this topic in our organization in the next few years. And I'm more than happy that I have the opportunity to talk to you this way. So SMA Europe is an umbrella organization which includes spinal muscular atrophy SMA patient and research organizations. We have been funded in 2006 and together with volunteers and staff, we manage research, therapy and care, healthcare policy and access, capacity building, communication and outreach. We aim to promote patient-relevant SMA research. We want to accelerate progress in and improve access to diagnosis, treatment, and care for people living with SMA. We also want to be an effective, sustainable organization that has the capacity to take collective actions. Then we want to have a strong membership network and to ensure that SMA Europe's voice really relies on evidence-based patient advocacy. Looking at our aims, we can clearly see that the FAIR principles are relevant to all our activities. During my preparation for this talk, I was undecided what I should be talking about. At the moment, we do not have a specific standalone project dedicated to FAIR principle that I could introduce to you today. And I think the title here, Droning in Data, Thirsty for Information and Starved for Understanding, actually summarizes the chances, but also the worries we have. As you have already seen, FAIR affects directly and indirectly everything we do. And we are facing classical challenges and opportunities, probably similar to the ones as you do, such as, Ownership and control of individual data. People also with SMA want to advocate for themselves, but sometimes consents seem to be complicated and burdensome. So it's really that we have many people raising their eyebrows when we are addressing them with that topic. And they are kind of afraid when it comes to that because the processes seem to be quite complex and sometimes they are burdensome. And also, of course, we are very well aware of the benefits that sharing data entails, but we also understand that there is a reluctance to share data, individual data, because it can harm the individual who is sharing. In SMA, we have really the risk of being expelled from access to treatment and medicines and sharing data could potentially increase such risks. We see in SMA that there is limited participants for research and studies and also limited time of these participants. We advocate for mindful data collection and study designs and support the use of clinical trial placebo data. We also see a large discussion when it comes to registries and data sharing. And we would want to foster the reuse of generated data 
by researchers to complement questions also potentially in the future. We see a high interest in SMA, which is very fortunate for us. We see many studies and research projects, also small studies. We see various data sets here and there, but there is little or no exchange at all, and also not really uh, much of a networking. I mean, there is, of course, networks, but um, it could be improved, definitely. So we fear fragmentation, also in registries, and we are missing a clear strategy on how to collect meaningful real-world data. The risks are here clearly that we might miss opportunities in these days that are so important to people living with SMA. We see a high investment of resources that are not always used in the most effective way because there is no exchange and there is um, also little information available on what actually data is out there. And there might be, as a consequent, application of efforts. So one solution we are looking into at the moment in SMA Europe is to form an SMA data alliance to really map all these existing data sets, but then also, of course, offer the opportunity to to collaborate and network so that it's not only a mapping exercise, but in the end that we really have a benefit for the community by investing into such a project. We also see that uh, the new advances bring potential benefits when it comes to therapeutic approaches. And one clear benefit is, um, is that we might be able to identify new or novel therapeutic targets and also approaches by applying big data. Uh, furthermore, and, and of course also uh, machine learning, because the, the one and the other isolated is, is obviously not working, but I think you, will, you already have or will have this discussion today. So I or we furthermore see a chance also in screening potential treatments that are actually lying in the shelves and drawers of researchers and companies. And here I really see a, a huge potential. Also, we are drawing in data and this is a big challenge. Um, there is risk of making wrong conclusions coming from not so meaningful data sets, but having huge data sets, looking into wrong correlations, because if you have a huge data sets, you can find any kind of correlations. And also, this might lead to a wrong confidence in this approach of analyzing only data that comes from big data and it might even misguide some of the decision makers. And also we need to be aware that data can be misused or misinterpreted to really present a strong case in someone's own favor. So it's, it's really key that we do not rely on data alone, but actually the data must be understood to gather insights. I think it's really, um, we managed to collect an enormous amount of data, but if we miss the steps to really translate this into knowledge, relate the data to a story, then data is meaningless. And it can even be, um, as I already said, misleading. So we really need to be aware that not all what is measurable is also valuable. So drowning in data, thirsty for information and starved for understanding. How can we ensure that the data collected, analyzed in the big data data sets is really meaningful? We certainly need to ensure that people and machines work hand in hand. Uh, we can use big data to see the big picture before then using 
like the thick data, um, the meaty data to zoom in into the details of people's lived experience and to see trends on the one hand, but we also need the thick and meaty data to understand more about the individual needs. Or perhaps we could even uh, go the other way around. We could perhaps better start from the individual needs and then move into the big data data sets to see if we can find trends and confirm them again with our thick and meaty data. So um, is there a way on how we can also include this thick data into our current approaches, this thick, this qualitative data? And can we also apply the FAIR principles here? I really would want to close my presentation today with uh, where there are opportunities for us as patient organizations. I think it was said uh, already many times that the patient organizations can be a driver in the verification, thank you for the word, process and facilitate the dialogue between the stakeholders. But also we can be at the core, at the heart of the integration of this qualitative data into the big data sets analysis and interpretations to then really help building actionable knowledge that leads to real impact for our patient communities and potentially to a real personalization in healthcare. Altogether, one goal. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all a wonderful day and a very fruitful discussion. Bye bye. That was wonderful of uh, Nicole to um, to send us uh, her video. So I'm uh, very grateful. Uh, now it's time for Michaela. Michaela and Ali, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I hope you are all well. I will share my presentation now. Okay, so I'm Michele Ali, and I will present you the Rare Disease GoFair Patient Network, which I proudly co-share uh, uh, with uh, Navel. We really work uh, um, amazing together. So I'm uh, a patient myself with, a, uh, with an ultra rare disease, and I was diagnosed uh, um, with a disease that at the time uh, was said to affect one in one million patients worldwide. Now, uh, it is predicted to be six in one million, so you can um, you can understand uh, how close uh, I am to um, the topic of data sharing and how it can be beneficial, especially for ultra rare diseases. So uh, today I will explain you uh, a little bit more about the GoFair uh, patient network, uh, why we decided to create this uh, network, what motivation and what drive led us to create this network. Of course, uh, which unmet needs uh, we want uh, to tackle and to address. And finally, I will tell you more about who we are. So how the Rare Disease GoFair Patient Network started? Uh, it started from the RD GoFair Implementation Network and the SEED Group, uh, which, which was initiated by Marco Rus. So inside the SEED Group, uh, the aim is, of course, to support the engagement of all stakeholders to implement and adopt FAIR in the rare disease community. And of course, uh, the aim uh, is to provide a home for stakeholders seeking advice. So we said, uh, um, I, we think, we really think that it is the time to create a home for connecting patient organizations. And this is how we started the idea of creating the Rare Disease GoFair Patient Network. So why uh, and what, what's the reason that led us to this? Um, First and foremost, uh, um, there were three main uh, points that led us to this. The first is, of course, to encourage a, a community of harmonized fair practices. We believe that patient organizations should be uh, central in this, and they should join all stakeholders in stimulating use and co-development of fair in the rare disease community. 
We wanted to create a space for patient organizations to connect, very important, to develop initiatives and to have patient organizations feel uh, uh, comfortable in finding a place to ask for advice, understand where to go and who to ask. And uh, of course, in here, I use the word accompany because we need to uh, always remember uh, the rare disease um, uh, ecosystem is made of, up of uh, small patient organizations as, as well. So uh, there are, of course, leading organizations like the Duchenne World um, Organization, but we seriously need to accompany patient organizations toward understanding and embracing FAIR in patient-led registries. We are aware of registries that are uh, uh, supported by patient organizations, but what we want to do is really, really to, uh, to think uh, and support to patient-led registries. And uh, finally, of course, we want to ensure that rare disease patients are actively engaged in each phase of planning and implementation of FAIR, which we have been seeing a lot today. So in here, I would like to show you uh, what uh, were the expectations of the members uh, joining the network. Um, some of them expressed uh, their, um, their um, motivation in creating change and empower patient-led registries, not only to understand the motivation behind the FAIR principles, very important. We now know that having FAIR data is important, but we want to go beyond that. We want to join existing efforts. Um, patients want to develop a framework for other patient organizations to follow, and we are really lucky to have uh, Navel with us uh, and uh, to learn more uh, about the experience of Duchenne. It's really, really important to share these experiences for all rare diseases. That's why I'm saying it's so, so beneficial for uh, my disease as well, which is so rare. And then we want uh, to spread awareness on FAIR and enable discussions between all stakeholders in a neutral setting. So this is uh, who we are. The idea started in January 2021. As I mentioned, um, Navel and I co-chair uh, the network. We have the support of uh, Masha Jensen. And these are uh, some of the rare, uh, well, the rare diseases that are involved in this uh, network. And we have also uh, Eurordis representing all rare diseases. So what are the unmet needs we want to address uh, by creating this patient network? We want to understand patient organizations' practical needs and uh, what support really is needed among patient organizations. We would like to map existing patient-led registries. Uh, we would like to collect insights and experiences. And uh, bit by bit, uh, we, uh, we would like to build a, road, a roadmap to help patient organizations by demonstrating in success stories like the one of Tushan. We'd like to involve and collaborate with all rare disease networks and organizations in this, uh, um, in these efforts. And we will like to identify, uh, advocate, and help disseminate efforts that showcase the application of fair data. We have been seeing this a lot today. And finally, this is in the long run, of course, we will be um, very happy and we would like to really uh, work toward developing a verification readiness tool for patient organization. So what is the motivation? Very, very important. Uh, I'm very close to this uh, um, because um, of what I do every day in advocacy for rare diseases. This is a shared responsibility toward not only a single rare disease, but toward a rare disease, um, a rare disease mission in order to overcome long lasting obstacles in all rare diseases. It's very important. That's why we are here and we are together um, speaking about FAIR. Awareness, of course, uh, we want uh, to join also this uh, and making sure that uh, patients and patient organizations understand the benefits that come uh, when data is fair. We want, be, we want to go beyond uh, the uh, meanings of um, fair principles, and we want really to work toward practical commitment, uh, toward good data management, sharing practices, and implementation inside patient organizations as well. And last but not least, we'd, we have to remember that in the end, uh, patients are the first and most important stakeholders, um, the first essential requirement to process health 
data is an informed consent. So we are speaking about data, about fair data, but in the end, uh, patients are the one who sign the consent and dictate the extent to which data can be accessed and reused. So we believe this is a very important uh, um, point to, to consider. So this is again uh, us, uh, smiley and, uh, <laughs> and happy to be in this group, but we of course, uh, we are looking for more members. We would like uh, your support. So if you, um, you are interested in joining us, uh, this is what we do every month. We meet uh, every last Thursday of uh, each month. We ask uh, our members, we are all uh, volunteer advocates, so we understand that this can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes, but we require at least uh, inputs through email. Uh, we would like uh, members to be responsive and help us identify opportunities to promote the mission of the network and, of course, contribute with tasks in uh, our annual work plan. So if you'd like to contact us, uh, Michaela, myself and Navel are always available and you can also contact uh, Masha if you'd like to join the network and to learn more about the network. Thank you very much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Michaela. And I'm uh, always very, very happy to be sharing and co being co-chair with you on this network. Um, so we, yes, please, please um, let us know if you have any questions uh, so we could answer them during the discussions with the speakers that George Paduras will be moderating for us. Thank you, Michaela. And now we will give the floor to Elvina uh, the, from the Duchenne Data Foundation. Elvina. Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, inviting me to present um, Duchenne Fair Use Case in the context of an EU-funded project called BIND. Can you see now? Yes, this is perfect. Thank Great. you, Alvina. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. Um, so I'm a molecular biologist uh, in training. I'm not a data scientist, but uh, through this fair journey with all these collaborators that are in the panels today, um, I have just um, uh, acquired some brief knowledge in order to go uh, through uh, the fair um, implementation, the so-called verification uh, of uh, bind data sets for Duchenne and Baker muscular dystrophy. So the brain involvement in dystrophinopathies, as it's called, uh, the bind project um, has uh, come to uh, a development because we uh, have realized that intellectual disability and, and neurobehavioral um, comorbidities um, affect more than half of the population of people living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the central nervous system comorbidities are results of genetic mutations in the dystrophin gene found in the brain, apart uh, from the muscle as well. And since this has been an overlooked field, uh, there are still no uh, therapies to address such comorbidities. And uh, one of, uh, of the core of uh, this project was also to implement these FAIR principles in order to facilitate brain research and give answers to specific um, research questions that are related to these comorbidities. As I mentioned, the aims of the project was to uh, have a better understanding of the uh, effect of different dystrophin isoforms in the brain and their involvement in the presentation of these central nervous system comorbidities. And that uh, hopefully will help us to develop outcome measures for future clinical trials, but also other assessment and intervention tools for the um, my, uh, care management of these people living with Duchenne and Baker muscular dystrophies. And as I mentioned, FAIR is all over the project and uh, DDF, Duchenne Data Foundation, is responsible for providing the central storage of all the buying data sets generated throughout the project involving data integration and analysis, having great collaborators with us in this journey, sharing and publication of this data uh, through our um, uh, website, our third data point, and also uh, we are responsible for any privacy protection and security aspects of 
the data management I just mentioned before. Um, as you can see, there are several types of data sets uh, generated within the project and coming from different sources, from control, disease, mouse models, and um, also patients. So this kind of uh, involves um, a lot of um, coordination between uh, the different bind partners and the, the FAIR experts in the verification process. So why we want to verify the bind data sets? And when we say data sets, uh, this comes to two levels. It's either the, the sum of uh, uh, the data for each data set, but also the description of this data set. And for a, a matter of um, you know, practicality, we just uh, categorize this verification process to uh, data verification and metadata verification within uh, the BIND consortium. And the reason why we want to do this is because we would like to, um, to have this data findable, interoperable, reusable also uh, in order to address research questions. So uh, this is a FAIR-based architecture that um, it's, has been developed by the LUMC Biosemantics uh, Group for another project for uh, COVID-19 patient data uh, within the context of the hospital. So now our aim is to implement this architecture in the BIND project. So each database for our project is uh, a different work package in the project, a different study team that is creating uh, different data. And we verify this data or the description of such uh, uh, data by developing specific uh, uh, models based on standard ontologies. And then each of these models that would be uh, developed for each work package are linked to a central data linking model. And then through specific uh, workflows, we'll be able to uh, analyze this data to address any research questions that clinicians and researchers, partners of this consortium have defined. I'm not gonna go through this um, uh, schema just to uh, show you what is the FAIR approach. It's a, a three-stage um, uh, process consisting of the pre-verification uh, step, the verification, and the post-verification. And the reason I just um, wanted to present it this today is that Although it's quite daunting to the uh, to its appearance, and lots of the bind partners um, were a bit overwhelmed by looking at it, uh, this just wanted to show that it's not just a, um, a static recipe; that uh, it's just steps to follow in order to come to fair data, but it's a more iterative process, a more uh, dynamic process that. Um, uh, requires uh, a coordinated and continuous dialogue between the buying partners and also the, the FAIR experts in order to work together and find a way to verify uh, the data. And along this FAIR journey, we have two great collaborators. We have the Leiden University Medical Center, which is also partner of this project and help us to develop the schemas for the data and also eBrains, which is a research infrastructure from Human Brain Project, which provides in-kind um, support to help us develop the, the schema for the metadata. So for this reason, the last year and a half, we have started organizing Bring Your Own Data workshops. And as I said, just to define those research questions that the partners would like to um, uh, address. And that give us the, the opportunity not to, to go to all the, 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 the mid data um, as the previous uh, speaker uh, talked about, but identify specific data sets and specific um, documents that we would, we would need to answer those questions. So it was like a by use case uh, verification. And this would also allow us to define the processes and the resources that we would like to have to uh, verification. And these um, concepts that appear in each data sets are then mapped to standard words, to standard ontologies, so then machines uh, can read. 
and develop, as I showed you some slides before, uh, a central data linking model where it would allow us computational analysis of all the verified data and metadata. The fair data will be stored in Duchenne Data Foundation repository and also other external public repositories that bar bind partners uh, would uh, wish to do so. And the fair metadata it will be stored in the eBrains knowledge graph and also our fair data point. And then having this central data linking model will allow us to, to query, to perform queries across the different um, work packages in the BIND project. So through this process, we identified some of the challenges and I've been very happy listening to Mark Wilkinson in the beginning to say there are a lot of now fair evaluation metrics, but how do we actually uh, you, you know, uh, combined uh, the, all this fairness of the data with uh, the data uh, quality, the data quality in order to meet some uh, governance compliance. So the data that uh, we we verify can have the maximum value for um, for its reuse. And another challenge for us was to um, how to undertake this fair implementation at scale, and this does not only involve uh, building the right infrastructure and uh, developing and integrating technologies and tools, but also harmonizing the needs of the different uh, stakeholders. And this is especially uh, important when it comes to regulatory requirements. And um, uh, we heard also by Yelena previously that uh, um, there's been another challenge, the data access uh, regulation, especially when it comes to, to, to patient data and how we can harmonize this um, access regulation within different um, institutions and care centers in different uh, countries. But uh, this uh, um, challenge can, can be, um, uh, how to say, managed in a way if we uh, could start thinking about uh, ways to have a machine accessible um, access regulation documents like patient con consents and data user requirements that hopefully can, can solve um, this, uh, this challenge. And of course, we need to develop and adopt as a community um, standards, uh, agreeable standards in order to connect um, not only the, the data sets, but also the data systems and the tools used uh, in order to um, perform this data visiting approach that Navelle and Mark Wilkinson uh, have shown that the, these first steps are, are quite successful. But there have been also some other challenges that have to come from um, the, the side of the, the partners. Uh, it has been really difficult to coordinate uh, different um, disciplines and backgrounds and also to engage some of the partners to become part of this um, verification process. Um, there needs to be um, more fair data experts in order to, to, to help to train uh, the scientists and uh, clinicians in order to understand and um, participate in this implementation of the FAIR principles. And of course, identify um, funding to support infrastructure and tools because we've been doing this work in, uh, within the pro uh, context of uh, an EU project but still um, for um, other organizations, um, financial support is a major uh, challenge. And the next step for us would be to, of course, change the, the, the culture of uh, in different stakeholders in the community. Hopefully this can, can come by developing uh, training toolkits and organizing uh, training webinars. Uh, but also invest uh, some more time uh, to develop tools, technologies that also these um, stakeholders um, could use. And um, as I mentioned in a previous slide, uh, we need as a community to agree on specific standards in order to represent the data, but um, also to promote um, the data sharing and now the data visiting um, capabilities. 
we do hope, uh, and I think BIND is an example of this, that uh, we perform uh, verification in a, in a more prospective way rather than a more retrospective way. So we um, we we try to have this um, data uh, fair by design, and uh, we 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 see that the need that we also need to develop methods to estimate what what's the return value for all these stakeholders that they wish to uh, engage. So it be it will become one more motivation to. Be, to start verifying uh, data sets. And of course, as I mentioned, for small scale organizations like registries, we need to find ways to support them either by training or financially for uh, fair implementation by uh, possibly um, European programs. And this will give us a way to have fair data born uh, by design and also um, facilitate uh, the fair convergence that is now a new concept uh, in the field. And at the end, uh, apart from the bind partners, I, I strongly would like to express my gratitude to um, our collaborators in this fair journey, the biosemantic groups uh, at the LUMC and the data curation group at the eBrains Research Infrastructure. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Edwina. Um, I will invite uh, George Valuras to moderate uh, this session or to speak with the, uh, the, the panelists. George? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Maybe if I could ask Monse, yeah. Elena. Uh, yeah, that's it, to put your videos on. Thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers. It was really great. Many different perspectives and many interesting issues that came up. Um, and it becomes quite uh, obvious that we need to work together, especially if we are to climb the highest mount mountain that uh, Navel has uh, very nicely um, illustrated in her presentation. Uh, I think that's that's the, the challenge now and the, the bet that we have. How can we um, make it make fair widely um, available, widely scalable? And for this, we, we need everyone uh, helps, I believe. Um, we have um, collected since the beginning of the meeting some um, responses, some ideas from everyone. And um, I think that Suzanne has put it together in a nice presentation that she will share with us. That's it. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. So I'm gonna go through that uh, very quickly. Um, first of all, we're really glad that we have with us a very wide spectrum of um, backgrounds, people coming from various um, uh, areas and with different motivations. This, is, this was the intention of this uh, meeting. Uh, next slide, please. And this this also puts very nice. This slide also shows very nicely how this meeting has brought together experts in verifying um, data with patients. And I think this combination is what we're seeking, and what all the presentations so far has have been proposing. And let's see what ideas came out of this uh, mix. First of all, the first question had to do with uh, challenges. And here we have, uh, uh, I don't know if it's just me, Suzanne, but some of it is not, oh, you have it all in one slide. Okay, um, I will, this, this makes it a bit difficult to, uh, to comment, but I have taken my own notes out of, um, out of this, so I will just use mine, I guess. Um, I have tried to cluster these, um, these ideas, these comments into uh, some basic issues. Several of the comments had to do with legal issues. Uh, legal issues that we all know, uh, um, legal barriers that have to do with access to data. Very interestingly, some people mentioned the need to change uh, the, people, the, the way we think, the mentality around data sharing, and from both ends, from all ends. And this requires, of course, also 
explaining what fair is, especially to non-experts, to patients. And this is not easy. Patient organizations, even if they, they do understand the need for fair, they need to, ex to explain that to uh, the members. Um, then there were some comments about technical issues, you know, interoper interoperability, availability of infrastructure, various difficulties of that kind, uh, availability of expertise, and we know we all know that fair does require bringing together, as I said earlier, uh, the users with the experts. Um, the need for um, trustworthiness, robustness, user friendliness. All these aspects that uh, the technical infrastructure needs to, needs to provide. And uh, last but certainly not least, availability of resources. Um, people who are going to work on this, time, money, all, the, all these need, are necessary. And we need to, uh, perhaps I, I can add to this, we, need, we also need to uh, demonstrate that these resources, whatever investment goes in, to uh, the FAIR project will uh, have a, a, a very clear return, which is definitely clear to us, but we also need to explain to everybody who is going to be involved, all stakeholders. Now, moving to the next question, we asked about uh, what will help overcome uh, those challenges. And um, I, I was very pleased to see that working together and collaborating is was among uh, perhaps the most popular answer to this question because this is exactly also the spirit of this meeting uh, that we need to work together. We also um, need to um, work together on specific issues like collecting data, um, solving technical issues like storage, security, and so on. Um, and also knowing where the data is and how, how, it can be, how, how it can be accessed. At the other end, we also need, it would also help, as uh, people have responded, if uh, the stakeholders, if we could engage all the stakeholders that are needed. And this, of course, related to the, uh, the discussion that, that um, sorry, Samira said earlier about um, explaining to people why they, they should be involved. Um, Issues about uh, what, whether whether a fair is fair, whether something that we call fair is actually fair. Uh, this has been um, uh, described to a large extent earlier, so I will I will uh, not spend any more time to that. And move, I will just move to the the final question, uh, which is um, what 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 would it um, you know what would you like to learn and. Some of the questions that people will be asking here are medical in nature, you know, like the disease progression. This is, this is one of the um, holy grails, if you want, of many diseases, especially um, DMD. Uh, but also, you know, more technical issues. I guess this comes also from the experts of, um, of our group, which says, you know, how can I, how can I prove to somebody that what they have been doing so far is inefficient, which I, I really like that. Uh, it's certainly the case, and it's, it would be nice to use uh, the data to, to be able to do that. Um, I will not focus too much on the specific questions, but it is quite clear that by bringing data together, by making data fair, we hope that we will be able to unlock um, uh, and overcome obstacles that currently seem too, too large, too, too, too tall to, uh, to climb. And um, especially in rare diseases, this is the, definitely the case. You know, we rarely have enough data to address these issues. Uh, I think that's the whole idea about FAIR um, and making data accessible. Um, so in conclusion, concluding my comment on this is that we are now, you know, based on the projects, the various projects that we have seen so far, the individual projects that were presented today, uh, we now have the uh, proof of concept. We know how to do it. We have the expertise. We brought together patients with experts, especially in the last uh, six presentations that we had. It was very clear that patients were becoming more experts. 
and experts were becoming more aware of facing its concerns. Um, so now we need to make the next step to scale up, to uh, make, make this, you know, climb the highest mountain that Nobel um, alluded to earlier. So we have the, the opportunity and also the necessity to work together towards this goal. Uh, that's, that's my point and that's the, um, the comment that I would like to make. And I would like to um, ask our speakers you know, how they feel about that and wh whether they have specific ideas of how we can uh, go about it. Let us I'll start with you, Elena. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's short. Um, the key answer would be the collaboration. We need to continue the existing collaborations, but also to uh, to kind of in, in involve wider circles. So the the system is not functioning uh, within one stakeholder, but uh, there is need to expand and to involve uh, everybody, basically. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, even including industry, because I was think, uh, I was uh, looking at one of the comments in, in, in the um, uh, Mensimeter, and it's written that um, not every stakeholder wants to share the data and actually pharma companies is usually the stakeholder who doesn't want to share the data they want to to get the data from everybody else so i think we all should unite uh, in a way in common efforts to find the middle ground and um, yeah and find the compromise between different interests so collaboration perhaps would be the the way to go thank you thank you Yela. Um, and moving to Monsa and the very interesting uh, issues that she, she raised about um, how uh, you know, local problems can be solved. Yeah. Uh, Indeed, I totally agree with what uh, Yelena said. Collaboration is so important. And um, I think that we are at a point that we all agree that uh, fair data is important. We but we still need to spread the word to uh, other uh, potential partners. Um, but I think Michaela will uh, talk about that too. So Thank I would you. like to, um, to take this point that you uh, made, uh, Monsa, because communication was raised, raised uh, in, the, in the suggestions and you know, communicating what we do and what we want to achieve is certainly very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, moving to Michaela. Yeah, indeed, uh, I would say getting into the practical cases, because we need to understand those practical cases. I believe we are still not aware of all the, the challenges and difficulties that there may be. At the same time, uh, I believe it's important to guide uh, patient organizations in understanding also the data that should be collected in uh, registries before making them uh, uh, fair uh, de novo. So um, I think it's important, yes, to understand also what patients would like to see in the future, because of course, uh, research, uh, um, I mean, also in regards to secondary use of data, it's important that these reflections happen before a registry is built. So yes, guidance, a lot of guidance and a lot of um, sharing of experiences, in my opinion. So this is what um, the Duchenne community is doing. And I think it, it should be done uh, in general across uh, rare diseases indeed. Michela, may I take, since you are, Seeing this uh, from uh, dif from a different perspective, um, and you are actually collaborating with patient organizations and patients at different levels. How do you see this collaboration happening? So you have um, organizations like Eurodis, for instance, that are you know very broad. They're covering um, many uh, diseases. You have local organizations like uh, what Monsu presented with their own problems. And you have also disease-specific um, organizations that are focusing on particular diseases. How do you see each of these contributing? Well, the multi-level collaboration is always tricky 
Uh, I think we need always to remember that uh, the main difficulties are uh, in the small communities and also, you know, at regional level. Um, we discussed this internally also in the patient and uh, the Ardigo for uh, patient network. And uh, um, a problem that was raised uh, is also, if you think about it, language barrier. We are, we are talking about uh, FAIR, uh, we are explaining FAIR, the importance of this, uh, but we are not really uh, reaching those very small communities. And I believe the collaboration needs to start uh, from the bottom. And uh, the language barrier still remains a big obstacle, in my opinion, because we risk uh, excluding many, many actors in the rare disease community and the ones that have the biggest difficulties. So um, the collaboration for sure can happen uh, when there is the intention and the motivation, but I believe the biggest complication is to reach really those realities that are at the bottom and that cannot really um, interact because also not only knowledge, but also language barrier. Thank you, Michaela. And I'm sorry to interrupt, George. Uh, I'm just being mindful of the time. And I want to give all our attendees uh, a short yeah. break. So, George, I would right. Right. like yeah. to invite you to I, wrap up. Yeah, I don't I don't want to uh, to say anything more. I think Michaela said, said it very nicely. Um, so unless Alvina has uh, anything to add. Um, yes, yeah. I, I, I hope Suzanne is not mad at me. But just one small, uh, well, very important thing. I'm a bit pragmatic as a researcher. I think all these things that we've discussed so far, um, it needs financial support. So we need to find ways as, uh, and Dushena is spearheading in all these efforts. As you mentioned, we've, we've now having proof of concepts. We need to, 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 to scale this to other rare diseases. And hopefully we can find ways through collaboration where to seek funding uh, to either improve um, most of uh, these processes or implement in other rare disease uh, populations. Thank you, Alvina. And yeah. with that, I think we can wrap up. It was a very interesting discussion and very interesting presentations. Thank you really very much for this. Uh, Suzanne, please. Yes, thank you very much. And Alvina, good point. Definitely. Uh, I will now please like to invite you all for just a short break. Uh, I'm giving you five minutes. Uh, and when we get back, we, we would love to reconvene uh, with some great speakers we have lined up for you. So thank you very much and see you all back in four minutes. Sure, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, well, after listening to the affair experts, to different patient organizations, now it's time to give the floor to uh, other speakers to discuss the building a solid ecosystem for data sharing. Uh, so we have uh, Jerome de Barres from the European Commission who will be presenting on the European health data space and how to join the dots to tackle rare diseases. Thank you very much, Jerome, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm John de Barros. I'm a policy officer at the European Commission in the Digital Health Unit, and I'm currently working on the implementation of VHTS. So what I will present um, today is the... Um, sorry about that. So yes, yeah, so as I say, I will just try to focus on very quickly on, a, on on what we are really proposing with the European health data space. So if you move on to the next slide. This is in summary what we are proposing. So when we talk about European health data space, it is a regulation and, and what it consists of is really a set of rules. So this is the different um, provisions in, in the legal proposals, but also, um, common standards, infrastructures, a governance framework uh, for the use of health data for healthcare, so the support of care in itself, but also for what we call secondary uses or using health data for research, innovation or policy making purposes. And these are below it the three objectives of, um, uh, of the open health data space. So first is to empower individuals to not only have access to, a to their data, but also control this data. 
Secondly, we want to, for sorry, call it during single market, just make it easier for us to have products and services. And here we highlight the particular electronic health record systems to really be adopted and, and implemented. Uh, and finally, when it comes to research, perhaps the most important part is to create an issue. We do have a consistent framework for access and for the use of uh, individuals' health data for the purposes I mentioned before. So if you go to the next slide, an important part to, to enable this is obviously to ensure a link and a perfect alignment with different legal proposal initiatives already ongoing or in development, such as, for example, the Artificial, the Artificial Intelligence Act. And it, under each of those, we try to either build on what is um, included in, in those different legislations and, and expand it to, to apply to the uh, to tailor the rules to the health sectors, for example, so with the for GDPR, for the data governance. And uh, forgive me. And uh, what we are um, also trying to do is to also align with all of those different either um, legislations or policies, for example, the European Health Union, where we try to support some of the key priorities of the European Commission. So if you go to the next slide, this is in summary what we're trying to do. The main objective, as we say, is really to ensure this effective use of health data. And then when it comes to the scope, we, we, we really have to broad areas of interventions, areas of work really. So the use of health data for, for primary use, for the use of care. And um, as part of that, the key provision that we are providing is to empower individuals to control their health data. So what do we mean by that? This empowerment, in our view, is to ensure, as I mentioned, not only access, but control. And this control could be um, being able to share this data with healthcare professionals of their choice, um, editing this information if it is missing or if it was incorrectly inputted, for example, but also restricting access to this data or part of it, if it is the choice of the person. So this is what really we, we view as empowering individuals over the health data. We also have series of provisions around standardizations and monetary certification of electronic health record systems. It is obviously one of the main data sources. So, so we try to, to really address um, uh, this specific resource and uh, uh, through standardizations, but also the, the proposed certifications. We also have provisions for a voluntary labeling of wellness apps. So we see a profusion of, of such apps. So we try to, to bring some structure as to the way they are identified uh, and labeled. So, so just to, to provide more information. And finally, we are promoting the European Health uh, Electronic Health Record Exchange format that is underpinning a lot of the work on uh, on primary use that we are performing mainly for the My Health at EU platform. So really try to, to promote it to existing data sources, but also expanding on this work to, to other um, types of data. And then we have all the work around the reuse of health data, so secondary uses. And uh, one of the key initiatives is to set up health data access bodies, so national agencies that will facilitate this, uh, the, the provision to this, this access to the to, to health data for uh, research, innovation, policy making, or, or regulatory purposes. Um, we also determine a series of purposes for which this data can be. Um, can be used. Uh, importantly, we also uh, include purposes for which this access would be forbidden. For example, and if it would be obviously detrimental to, to persons. And uh, we also have series of provisions to how will this data be made available. One of the key part, part is really this concept of data permit that defines the different elements of a of a specific access. So, what data would be requested or be, would, is, is has to be made available um, to whom, for which purpose, during which time. So, we really try to to make sure uh, it is very clear 
in this permit as to what will be made available, uh, what will be the conditions for making this, this data personal data available. We are also um, promoting, uh, in that case, making mandatory the use of secure processing environments, so safe um, environments would still be made available where access will be restricted to um, only authorized users where the data made available would be either anonymized or pseudonymized, and where uh, this data would not be able to be downloaded. So that's also very important by making sure that no personal data comes out of this secure environment, and also it making it an environment where the analysis that has to be performed is able to be performed. Um, Finally, as mentioned here, we also ensure that throughout the process, no identification is, is able and re-identification, as a matter of fact, is forbidden and will be punished. So this is the different provisions that we we we, we are proposing to achieve those goals. So for primary use, entering the single market I mentioned before, and for secondary use, facilitating for more research and innovations and better policy making. So this is all the means as to say that our proposal when it comes to the legal part, what's in the proposal, we obviously have series of activities trying to support data quality. So mainly by, for example, proposing the development of a data quality and utility label to really make it easier for user to, to really assess the usefulness of the data set and its interesting quality through the metadata made available. We are um, expanding on the MyHealth ITU uh, infrastructure that already exists, and we are currently developing Health Data ITU. That will be the infrastructure underpinning the secondaries of health data. I will touch on a bit more later. Uh, and finally, we have a series of activities around capacity building. So how can we have members that be ready to, to implement DHDS once it is approved? So if you go to the next slide. So this is, in a nutshell, what we, what we are trying to achieve here, really. So through the use and reuse of data sources that you see here in the middle, they're just examples, but these on the left and right hand side are what we are trying to to, to achieve for the different perspectives of users here. So for citizens, this empowerment I mentioned before, uh, for healthcare professionals, being able to have access to the relevant data at the right time. Policymakers, for researchers, for um, uh, this is really about making sure that you have a facilitated access to data for better policymaking and, and, and better research. And for the industry, uh, it really is about having a clearer framework for uh, ensuring your solutions are adopted. We go to the next slide. So here, when it comes to secondary use, so this is one of the key components that we are proposing. So this infrastructure, have that you that I mentioned before, um, and you see here again the concept and entries before the health data access body, this national entity that is, as you said, the entry point for data users that will be um, requesting access to this data, but also for all data holders, the data has to come from somewhere. Uh, and obviously the legislation proposes to um, facilitate this access by making it mandatory for this data in the first place to be known, but also to be made available should a permit be issued. So the data tax body has this role and is also um, the, uh, entry point in the infrastructure, one of the key component infrastructures interacting with other habit access bodies, um, but also European agencies such as the European Medicine Agency, OECDC, as well as other data sharing infrastructures. Think of, for example, the European research infrastructures that already exist. And in the middle, you also see that we foresee the development of core services provided by the European Commission. And here it is really about developing services that will support the infrastructure, the, the idea is not here to create any kind of centralization of data or, or, or such thing. It's really about providing services that are common, that just make it possible for information to be shared. Um, I think, for example, a, a European dataset catalog where the different national catalog will be, will be centralized. So this is the type of services that will be developed here. If you go to the next slide. So here this is 
a, a brief overview of how we, we foresee this data being available from discovery all the way to the publication of results and outputs. So if you keep pressing, it is a, um, and it has animation. So in the first part, we want to enable researchers to understand what health data will be made available uh, if you go to keep, keep pressing. So this is the first part we're trying to, to enable really. Uh, this is to support a permit applications and getting an answer whether or not this data can be used for the research projects being proposed. If a permit is issued, this is where health data access bodies and data holders intervene to prepare this data by making it available in the case of health data holders or facilitating access to this data in the case of health data access body. Um, as mentioned here, this data is then provided to users in a sequencing environment that is controlled by the health data access body. And uh, this is where the data is used. This is where the analysis uh, takes place and data is processed for, for this analysis, always in a secure space as mentioned here, where only researchers uh, or anybody identified in the permit has access to this data. And finally, the important point is we want to make sure that any analysis that takes place is obviously reported on by the different health data access bodies, but also uh, we want to promote what is actually taking place. Uh, and that's why we make sure an important part is to publish the result, the outcomes, or the outcomes of the analysis performed. So as I mentioned, so we when it comes to legal proposal, so it was submitted in May this year. It is currently being negotiated with the European Parliament and European Council. As you can imagine, we cannot wait for the the negotiations to finish. So, which is why we are already working on the implementation of the EHDS. And one of the key initiatives is this health EHDS to health data TU infrastructure. So, and the first project towards it was the launch of a pilot for this health that you infrastructure. So this happened last month. And um, it will be a project lasting for two years with a budget of 5 million for the consortium work, so by the different partners, but also 5 million for the central services, this blue box that I mentioned here before. And um, and the objective is really to, to develop and deploy a, a network of nodes. So think, it, think of it as a an embryo of what will be this infrastructure that will then be scaled at a later stage. And really the idea is that they help determine what is needed for this infrastructure to be deployed once the um, um, the HDS is approved and can be scaled. And part of the work will also be obviously on validating this infrastructure for use cases. Um, perhaps of relevance here, it is a I uh, would like to mention that one of the partners is Orphanet. So all aspects around data specificities from the rare uh, disease and uh, also the link to initiatives such as the um, the joint program on, on rare disease and their virtual platform will be brought to the consortium um, by the participation of this specific partner. So I will stop here and open the floor to any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Jérôme. Um, they can, um, in fact, ask questions in the facility questions and answers. So they are not going to ask you uh, straight away, but we will collect the questions for you. Very well. Because we are running a few minutes late. <laughs> so yes. we will give the floor to Daniel Liva Morales from the Europe European Medicines Agency um, Daniel, are you here? Yes, I am here, ready and waiting. Okay. I'm just about to share my screen. Uh, Great. And I hope Anna will be okay, because um, I promise we will start her presentation at four, so I hope she won't be too, uh, too cross with us. Go ahead. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, my background is uh, I'm a family doctor, a GP. Uh, academic, so a clinical epidemiologist, and now a uh, regulator as well. And I'm based in the data analytics team at uh, the EMA 
And I'm just going to give you a, a bit of an idea about the real world evidence strategy and how that hopefully you could see that that could benefit sort of a, the, the general understanding uh, for rare diseases. These are my disclaimers. So um, a little bit about the real world evidence strategy. Um, well, Jerome's very kindly uh, talked about the HDS, and this is a, a large aspect of changing real world evidence environment. I'll talk about the Darwin EU and also how the HDS may facilitate how we move forward with our real world evidence strategy. Um, and then uh, really just talk about uh, some of the considerations which um, maybe are relevant to us, but also to HDS and, and maybe to some uh, of yourselves in the network based on the sort of presentations and the work that you're doing about uh, uh, integrated sort of uh, uh, data collection and analysis. So um, I'll just minimize that. So from a regulatory perspective, we can give you three uh, quite sort of good examples of where real world data analyses may be able to support uh, the different uh, EMA scientific committees and their decision making. So the first one is um, how real world evidence, uh, which is the, the analysis of uh, second use of health data can support the planning and the validity of applications um, in a sense of assessing the feasibility of existing sort of studies that are planned and trials to observational and non-interventional studies, but also being used to assess um, the applicability of evidence that is generated and how closely uh, that fits the real world population. Another useful area of where real world evidence can support is understanding the clinical context. And often that may involve understanding the natural history of disease um, in the broad sense, disease epidemiology, but also about how clinical practice and uh, clinical settlement for EMA, how medicines utilization is being used. And then a little bit more, which is more the traditional, I suppose, pharmacoepi uh, epidemiology side is looking at the therapeutic effects of uh, medicines in the real world. Now, real world uh, evidence and real world data has historically been used quite a lot to assess medicine safety. And, and there's increasingly an amount of work and methods trying to be established to understand where evidence on effectiveness can also be generated and also how real world evidence can be used to evaluate the impact of regulatory decision making. And then similar approach that could also apply to other areas out with of regulation, such as policy or guideline decision making as well. So if we think of real world evidence as a, almost a, 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 we consider a very important pillar for health planning and response. And we certainly saw a lot of that during uh, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But um, if we look at why we would potentially want to monitor the use of medicines, well, uh, from a regulatory perspective, we could predict demand potential shortages. Uh, the understanding of natural disease history, okay, it can support therapeutic developments, but if we think of the context of rare disease, um, often uh, whether a medicine can uh, receive orphan status and requires quite an accurate um, estimation of prevalence of that disease, uh, to see if they would qualify. And then obviously evidence of treatment effects, um, safety and effectiveness, but also uh, is a potential evidence that uh, certain effects of medicines could be repurposed for uh, another uh, indication, for example. Now, in order to really deliver on the real world evidence strategy, it really needs uh, quite a solid foundation and operational infrastructure in order to conduct studies. I'll tell you a little bit about how some of these studies have been uh, conducted. So EMA can generate real world evidence in uh, three different ways. Um, uh, EMA has uh, access to a number of in-house databases. These are databases that predominantly co cover primary care records from France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Romania, and also the UK. And there is some development to get access to some hospital prescribing data sources, which historically have been quite challenging to really access. Um, another avenue that we have to actually uh, uh, conduct uh, real world evidence studies is through uh, uh, framework contracts, 
with uh, external research uh, organizations, and these are completely academic or non-academic. Um, and they have access to a wide network of data sources, and we tend to uh, you know, put uh, a, a tender out uh, to conduct a study. And this was done quite a lot, uh, certainly recently during the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and also uh, uh, for a rare disease example as well. Uh, but the new thing um, that's really been established over this last year or so um, is uh, the Darwin uh, EU Centre. And I'll focus a little bit more about that because it, it really does feed into this changing real world evidence environment, but also uh, overlaps quite a lot uh, with the European health data space. So the, the Darwin EU network, this is going to be a federated data network um, where the EMA can access um, skills and expertise in terms of the conduct of studies that are based within a, a central coordination center, which is currently at the Erasmus MC in the Netherlands. Um, and they have access to a number of data partners or data nodes that contain um, uh, and host their own data. Now, one of the strengths of uh, this type of network is all the data is standardized in how it is structured and coded uh, into a common data model. And this the common data model that's being used is the OMOP common data model, which is actually quite a, a large number of communities that utilizes both within, increasingly within Europe, but also uh, in the US. So it works very well for doing federated uh, analyses. Um, and what we do is we get um, requests coming from committees, you know, liaison committees, but also we are linking in with uh, HTA as well. Um, some of those committees are PRAC, uh, CHMP, but also uh, the Committee for Orphan Medicines and the, the whole range of committees we are engaging with in order to identify potential questions that could be answered within uh, this real world evidence network. We're currently in the establishment phase, so we're just coming towards the end of the first year. Um, and what we have been able to achieve is to look into onboard 10 databases in the first year, and over the whole five year cycle, is looking to uh, have onboarded 50 in total. Um, and also to set up obviously the governance of how this is going to work. And there are four studies that have been uh, commissioned now to run through this. And next year, this will scale up to 16 and then up to uh, 70 the year after this. So there's a lot of scope uh, for doing uh, real world evidence studies to, to support a lot of the different committees questions. So um, which data sources will Darwin EU use? Well, I mentioned earlier on that uh, in-house we have access to prime care data sources and often that has been the traditional type of data that's been maybe available to uh, commercially uh, license and to use. But the aim of Darwin EU network would be to have a very broad uh, type of uh, data source and broad representation. So broad geographically, um, but also to involve primary care data sources and secondary care data sources, broad in terms of the types of populations, uh, one that is generalizable to the whole population, but we'll also consider sort of rare disease areas as well. Um, and the type of data source in terms of electronic health records, administrative claims as well. Um, one of the key requirements is that all of this data uh, should be uh, uh, in a common data model format and specifically in the OMOP common data model. And there's been a big initiative over the recent years through the European Health Data Network, Eden, uh, to really convert um, up to 100 data sources, I believe, into the OMOP common data model. And actually that's been a very useful catalyst uh, to potentially feed into Darwin EU. The data tends to be patient level data uh, with the opportunities to potentially link records, um, but on a pseudo anonymized basis. And the network allows us to onboard databases that have much more sort of granular information on medicines that might not uh, otherwise be um, available, sort of a, a high level aggregate uh, data. And um, of course, we can link those uh, drug exposures to clinical events and patient characteristics as well. This is the sort of current geographical distribution of the data sources from the first year. Um, and as we onboard more and more data sources, we hope to you know, expand and get a, 
much better coverage, but it's also uh, not just coverage, it's the type of data to answer the specific questions. And even though 50 data sources sounds quite a lot, yeah, when you think about the geographical representation and the different data sites and populations, it isn't a lot uh, at all. And you possibly be able to reflect on that and, and consider how many disease registries, rare disease registries there are you know, uh, by themselves. So the types of analyses that we can run through the Darwin U network, we have some that we consider as off the shelf. These are sort of pre-programmed that cover um, general epidemiology studies on prevalence, incidence, or characteristics of patients. Um, but we also do some off the shelf um, uh, studies uh, that are more complex. And these can be things like cohort studies for etiological studies or self-controlled case series. So we have um, the, the off the shelf sort of uh, general epidemiology ones that are relatively quick to, to conduct. Um, and obviously the complex studies take a little bit longer to, to perform. But actually through the federated network, once the programming is done, the execution tends to be much quicker. One of the, the, the rate limiting things is often the, the approvals processes rather than the actual execution of the study package. And once these packages have been uh, uh, sort of formed, um, they can uh, have the opportunity to uh, count as a routine repeated analysis. So if we wanted to monitor uh, drug utilization once a year or a, a specific safety monitoring that we want to conduct, then we can do this quite frequently. Uh, Emil, I'm time. sorry to interrupt. Uh, yes. I know that we have uh, another speaker coming up. So if you would please like to wrap up in about two minutes, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. So this just gives us some of the examples of the studies. It's uh, the epidemiological studies of rare blood cancers that have been conducted this year, uh, drug utilization study of valproate and antibiotics, and a complex study really looking at mortality rates in asthma, but how this varies according to trial eligibility. So some of these uh, things could be uh, certainly applied into rare disease uh, areas as well. We've already seen some information about the European health data space. And the focus of this, for this presentation for me is about the infrastructure, which certainly the Darwin EU network is an example of and what we're hoping to leverage uh, moving forward. Um, this slide again, Jerome showed, and the focus here is to show how from a health um, data EU project point of view, the EMA and the ECDC are really very key stakeholders of the EHDS. And therefore we hope to be able to uh, contribute and to develop this infrastructure and also leverage it in due course as well. And as such, there are a number of real world data pilots that have been conducted. And we are leading one of them, which is a natural history of coagulopathy related to sort of events in COVID-19 patients and vaccines. And some of the uh, findings from that won't just be the clinical information, but it was the process of how this type of a network works and informs some of the EHDS to, to decision making. But I think I'll leave it at that just now and I'll look forward to questions later. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, we uh, Because we're running a little bit late, so I'm going to give the floor to Anna Rath from EJPRD. Uh, Anna, EJPRD was mentioned a few times today, so I'm very happy that you're here. And uh, please forgive us, we're only three minutes late, it's not too much, right? No, no problem. <laughs> no problem. You have to leave as well. You can't stay with us. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very sorry for that. But lots of things are happening today at the same time. So, um, but I'm very glad to be here and say thank you, Noel. I will share my screen, and um, you will tell me if you see the slides. In yes, full screen, great. yeah. So I will um, uh, I will talk about another uh, space, but that is a federated one uh, dedicated to rare diseases. Uh, that is called the European Joint Program for Rare Diseases Virtual Platform, uh, in which uh, we are several here uh, working um, on. And I will minimize that. Um, so. Um, why we are doing that is that is simply because, as you know, uh, there are lots of infrastructures, catalogs, tools, data sources uh, that are 
fragmented, not talking to each other, not interoperable, and some of them are interesting to foster rare disease research, but that are, are not rare disease specific, um, but uh, rare disease researchers even don't know that they exist. So that is the situation we faced at the beginning of the European jo Joint Programme <coughs> sorry for rare diseases. And uh, what we plan to do is to uh, try to enhance the interoperability of all these, these uh, diverse and, and, and very different resources or data sources in a federated system uh, that uh, is fair compliant uh, and uh, to facilitate the access to this federated ecosystem for, for researchers through a portal uh, and then disseminate uh, by engaging when the, the system is, uh, is uh, ready or, or almost ready in order that more resources are joining. So that is um, a, a slide that is make, uh, made for impressing you on the number of resources we, we have. Uh, but just uh, um, uh, for you to understand the diversity we are coping with here, uh, we have catalogs of registries, biobanks, of cell lines and animal models, knowledge bases, tools and, uh, that are supporting clinical and translational research, data deposition and analysis platforms, tools, and then data sources, registries, and mainly uh, ERN registries, but your registry, the Duchenne registry is on board and biobanks and other kinds of data sources, including some on cross omics uh, that we are um, uh, delivering as the EJPRD. But in reality, what happens uh, and what we are trying to achieve is an ecosystem, a network in which each one of these resources, whatever the type of resource, is enabled to connect with others, um, uh, with all or some, uh, depending on their choices and uh, interests, uh, in a federated way. Uh, and uh, at the same time, building a central portal, a central door or gate to access the whole network. And that we call the EJPRD virtual platform portal. Um, that will, um, uh, in a federated manner, uh, enhance the discoverability and queryability of all the resources onboarded in the network. So uh, to do that, we work over the, the last years in the project, enhancing and making the resources and data sources uh, ready to join uh, this, uh, this network. So we um, uh, selected a set of standards. We promoted uh, the use of data standards in, in the different uh, sources um, and other rare disease specificity. So the OFA code for designating each rare disease in resources that are not rare disease specific like um, uh, pluripotent uh, potent cell line uh, uh, catalogs. Uh, mouse models, catalogs, etc., and get the metadata, so the description of these resources structured in a fair way, and providing guidance and assistance and hand in hand work with all the resources and data sources through verification resources. And I suppose Noel already talked about that and many of the, my colleagues. So in this, um, in this virtual platform, we want to allow for different level of querying the different uh, nodes in the network. So we defined four levels that are for um, metadata discovery. So in a, in a sense, describing that the resource is there and what, what uh, uh, the resource has to offer, and then to discover uh, uh, deeper and deeper and to query deeper and deeper, having different kinds of results, uh, those resources that want, want to allow this type of queries, uh, provided that yes or no, we have authentication and even authorization 
for some users to perform some kinds of queries uh, down to a federated analysis uh, at the data level. So that are the, 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 so the goals. Here you see some examples of that. So metadata discovery, that is what we want. Every single resource in the network it, it has at least, but we expect that the, the data sources and, uh, um, uh, and the most of all the registries we uh, will allow for more in-depth up to the fourth level. So we can answer different kinds of things, which resources are collecting data and Duchenne, um, uh, then yes or no. So uh, are there fem female patients with, that are symptomatic with, uh, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy or, the, or have the counts, how many patients with cardiomyopathy uh, and Duchenne muscular dystrophy having a given treatment that is really level three, and then a federated analysis, so connecting different types of uh, data sources in order to have the genotype from one, one resource, the, the, the clinical data from another, and combine the data um, performing um, performing uh, uh, queries. So what we do is that uh, we work with the resources in order that they are understandable. So their the description that are understandable for humans, for engineers, so interacting with the resource, and for my, uh, for uh, machines, so uh, having um, a global so a total verification of the resource. We are providing middleware services in order to interact with the network and we develop a portal and give specifications in order that each node can uh, develop its portal in order to access the other nodes. Uh, I will squeeze this one because it's, it's kind of the same thing. So for each level, the resource will need to do something and we will need to do something with the resource in order, in order to interact. Um, so, um, what we, we want is uh, that the, the resource um, express what they want to do in the network and to provide the solutions that the EGP recommend or and or provides in order that uh, the resource can onboard, can uh, enable a human and, uh, and machines uh, to interact with them and then to enable a global interoperability and enable at the end data science, so make the, a good use of resources. So in order that at the end, we can have an efficient discovery of what is there for rare disease researchers to use, that we can uh, allow for automated queries and uh, reuse resource descriptions uh, to, for other uh, purposes in order that, the, that uh, resources or registries do not have to enter the data several times because they are enhanced to share their uh, data elements with others. And that is the starting point as well, getting uh, uh, us prepared to uh, perform federated analysis. So how we work, we uh, work with the resource asking them, uh, so assessing the readiness which are their objectives, how ready is your data, how are your technical capabilities, and then uh, adapt our response, let's say, to the situation of the resource. They, uh, should they just take the solutions and, because they have all the cap technical capabilities to develop by them, themselves, or they need to have, um, let's say, uh, out-of-the-shelf solutions just to install, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then um, first, uh, the, the level one that is a kind of, kind of mandatory is the, is, the, is the first one, and then accompany in, or, in order that they can go as far as they want to go. And that, uh, that it is, uh, so we are preparing a documentation on how to onboard the individual platform and training courses will be provided uh, next year. So um, the requirements can be in terms of staff, 
on the, 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 the way the, the metadata, so the description are structured, um, and there could uh, be some hardware and software requirements, um, but there are solutions for those that do not have uh, the, full, uh, the full capacities. Um, so the, all this information and the requirements, depending on the level of readiness, uh, <clears throat> will be uh, uh, explained in this onboarding uh, document. So the virtual platform as a conclusion is, uh, enables interoperability, syntactic, because the data can be modeled differently and we need to have a translation from its syntax to an, another, semantic, so providing mapping services that could even be installed at the level of the, of the registry in order to um, go from one, one terminology to another, both for diseases and for genes, a technical, semantic, and non-semantic approaches, different uh, uh, technological approaches or options are being interoperable with each other. And um, what we, we ensure that is the virtual platform as such as the network is fair, so is, um, uh, and uh, is, is, is semantic because we adopted something, but that is too technical, that is being adopted in the European health data space. So uh, in order that we prepare the next phase. And the, the next phase is that what we are developing now enables scalability in the future. So to expand the metadata and data models, to make that the, the virtual platform can adapt to new resources that are coming and that we provide methodologies for verification and for onboarding in order that um, more resources can join in the future uh, after, I'm sorry, after HAPRD um, ends. And then we uh, want to, uh, the Rare Disease Partnership that has the, the um, ambition to unlock the full potential of health data and research data, um, uh, is taking the legacy of the EGPRD. So uh, because we have the methodology and the support uh, services in place and the standards, metadata, interoperability tools, verification, um, also pathways and network for diagnosis, biomarkers and therapeutic targets, and synergy with other data environments, as I will show you, um, we want to take it further to the next phase in uh, the, the Red Disease Partnership. So here, just to, to, to show you that there are several categories of projects, initiatives uh, on health data for primary use, so for better care, um, for secondary use, so for research and evidence-based decision-making, and then fully research data. And we are ensuring that the um, the technologies and approaches that we are using here that are based on GCAT are also interoperable with other types of uh, ways of doing because in different projects we, and, and with different objectives, of course, there are different um, approaches and tools used. So in the, that, is, uh, that is not set on stone, but that is the, what you find in the concept paper for the Red Disease Partnership that will start uh, end of um, or mid to 2024 is that there will be transversal support services and that integration services is taking so the legacy of the uh, what we are doing in the uh, EJPRD to integrate new uh, new data but uh, in the clinical research network, that is kind of a new, uh, a new uh, infrastructure. Let's uh, let's speak like that in Europe. That is providing all the services and tools that are necessary and support that are necessary to conduct more efficiently clinical research in the European space. Uh, we want to um, so. Uh, to, to provide a data exploitation hub because we will have developed these federated analysis capacities, but we also will bring 
all that is developed in the HAPID in terms of modelization of diseases, pathways and networks in that in order to identify biomarkers, uh, uh, therapies, targets and so on that can be um, provided. And we want to also introduce what we haven't introduced already in the models that are the, the, the COAs, also the clinical outcomes assessment instruments and PCOMs that we are developing and, or, or identifying, not developing, but identifying in the ERICA project in which we are collaborating and, and I am also um, a part of it as Franz Schaeffer, my co-lead in the Pillar 2 is, is, is doing as well. So we hope that it will uh, EJP will, will be prepared to take this next phase that is totally different from the EJP, but that is uh, building upon what has been provided in the EJP ID. So thank you very much, and I uh, stay with you to take some questions. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, and we have also Yanis Mimoni with us who will join the, uh, the discussion, which is great. So now we're going to give the floor to a clinician to Leo Short School from Radbat UMC. Uh, Leo, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thanks, Navel. Uh, let me share my screen. Now, first of all, I'm a um, I'm a medical doctor working at the University Hospital in uh, Radboud, Nijmegen. Um, I'm uh, dealing with patients with vascular malformations, so nothing to do with Duchenne. Uh, but uh, within the, oh, let me see. Uh, within the uh, VASCER and the ERN, where, where I'm basically active in, I'm co-chair uh, for VASCER in itself. Um, I'm also responsible for the building of the registries, and as such, I'm closely collaborating with uh, Peter Brown and Navel. Um, besides that, I'm uh, vice chair of the World Organization for Vascular Malformations. And in that group, we basically started seven years ago with building prompts for vascular malformation patients. Um, I'm basically going to talk about that work because I think it's really important, basically, what we did, and it's also uh, can be extrapolated to, to the work done in all the other ERNs. So we're going to talk about clinical reported outcome versus patient reported outcome. Leo, sorry to interrupt you, but we can't see your slides, not yet. Okay, then I go back. One moment. Mm -hmm. If you prefer me to run your slides, we have them as well. Oh, so you can just uh, say next slide. Yeah, but I have a, a different set of slides. Ah. Uh, it's now visible? Yep, this is great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, now if you... Uh, is this visible? This is in the middle. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, if you basically look at the uh, uh, the clinical symptoms, uh, the biological function symptoms, functional status, this is basically measured by uh, clinical parameters, and their overall quality of life is measured by the prompts. So. Almost to give a conclusion in, uh, of the whole presentation, you basically need both. Uh, parameters. Now, if you go to the clinical reported outcome, uh, those are things like survival analysis, uh, size of tumors, uh, lab values, like uh, fibrinogen, creatinine, tumor markers. You can look at pathology analysis. And those are things which basically were used in the past in a lot of the studies. They are reproducible, they're measurable, and there are many statistical tests well developed to basically to analyze those things. The main disadvantage is that it doesn't take into account the patient perspective. To give you uh, one idea, A and B are uh, CT slices of a patient with a metastatic carcinoma in the liver. So what you basically see here is the, uh, is the liver itself with a, a large tumor inside. This is the heart. This is the same large tumor inside the liver. And this is after treatment. Now, this basically was reported as a good result of the treatment. 
except the patient didn't live any longer. So if you look at his survival, it was basically the same as patients were basically non-treated, but he hit, he basically had the uh, uh, effect of the treatment itself. So basically meaning that he was quite sick for a couple of months. Now, if you go to the patient reported outcome, the prompts, basically prompts are questionnaires intended to be filled in by the patient and specifically designed to quantify the well-being. The value of the prompts have been extensively studied and is basically increasingly used worldwide because there is a shift towards value-based healthcare. Prompts are frequently associated with measuring the outcome domain quality of life. And you've got to realize that quality of life is a broad overarching outcome domain which include health and which can be further subdivided into uh, physical, mental, and social functioning. Now, when is a prompt valid? And, and I think this is really important because there are many prompt skills out there. But first of all, you need to have a question which basically really measures what you would basically intend to measure. The question itself has to be reliable, which means that if you ask a question to the patient now, and a month later, in the same circumstances, you need to get the same answer. And it needs to be responsiveness. It needs to be responsiveness because basically meaning that if there are changes in the patient, you need to measure it. And the only way to find this out is to run multiple studies, really good prospective studies on every level to uh, uh, basically quantify that but what you are using, the problem you're using is really valid. And the, most of the problems nowadays out are known to have problematic measurement proposities. So you can't use them. And the other thing is, and that's for uh, that's valid for all the rare diseases that you, and I will further discuss that in the next slides, that you have a generic proportion of the problems, basically meaning uh, items which are general or are, are equal for all rare diseases like the depression state, uh, uh, how well the patient is feeling himself, uh, the pain scores and so forth. And you've got specific disease specific elements which are not measured by the general PROM and which can also need be, uh, can also meet, uh, needs are basically different compared to other uh, ERNs. Now for the vascular malformations, uh, that's a project which started about six years ago in the EMC, which were then uh, taken on by the worldwide organization. And they already have two PhDs uh, on that topic. And Max Locksworth was the last one. The first thing they did was a Delphi analysis. It was a worldwide uh, study involving all major centers and patient organizations to see what sort of items we needed to collect. And what we found out that basically for the generic ones, if we had all those elements, and then we looked at the quality of life uh, questionnaires available, that the promise the, the questionnaire developed by the uh, one of the American uh, universities was the best one for us. For the disease-specific one, we built our own uh, questionnaire, which is called the OVAMA. And this is just an example. So you have the patient-reported outcome and the clinic, uh, clinician-reported outcome. So this is basically what you get out of the uh, electronic health records. The patient-reported outcome this part is covered by the uh, promise scales. So this is basically the generic part. And this is the disease specific part, which is covered by the OVAMA questionnaire. Uh, this is just an example of the OVAMA questionnaire, which basically what we're looking at general appearance, head and neck symptoms and satisfaction. And this is another example of uh, how this was uh, basically done. In questionnaires itself, the moment you start doing the modeling work, you can't have any open questions. So you need to have uh, uh, questionnaires which looks like this. Then to go back to the promise scales for the generic ones, it basically involves uh, five different uh, uh, items. Uh, the promise scales, again, were developed by uh, one of the American universities, um, adopted afterwards by many. And at the moment, it's basically considered worldwide as one of the best quality of life questionnaires available. How do we use it? Well, in prospective studies, 
um, we send these uh, questionnaires to the patient. These are for the disease-specific parts. These are for the, for the generic parts. And after the treatment, at certain times, we repeat them with these measurements. Scoring is uh, quite simple. You just get a certain number, you um, add them to each other, and that will give you a, a general outcome number, which basically can be used to compare uh, patients or uh, outcome of studies. Uh, if you really go into studies, then basically you need to look at the individual uh, questionnaires. So what's next? Uh, I think it's absolutely essential that quality of life questionnaires need to be included in the registries, whatever registry you have. They need to be made interoperable. And I have been involved in the modeling of the uh, Duchenne uh, PROM. And I can tell you it's not an easy task. So there's a lot of work still uh, have to be done for, for all the other UNs to make their PROMs uh, operable, interoperable. And the other thing is, that there will be cost related to the uh, use of the uh, the promise scales. We looked into the other questionnaires available, like the, the PetQL and the uh, Volva and the uh, SF, uh, I think it's 39. And basically for vascular malformations, even for the generic part, we proved in high quality studies that they were basically not sensitive enough. So that's quite uh, that's quite a, a, a well some finding which we basically didn't expect it because those questionnaires are free of charge, and we basically we ended up with going to the questionnaire which in the end basically will cost us some money. For conclusion, both clinical reported outcome and the prompts are essential to evaluate the therapies. Both should be included in registries. For the prompts, you basically need a generic and a disease specific questionnaire. All developed prompts, and I, I know that a lot of the ERNs are st still in the process of developing their disease-specific questionnaires, need to be evaluated with high-quality studies. Uh, the questionnaires also have to be in the native language, um, and if you basically translate them, they again have to be validated. If, however, we don't implement the prompts in the, in the, in the registries, it basically means that uh, the, the real value of those registries will really be diminished. And well, for the generic part, I basically try to, to illustrate that a one size fits all doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. Um... The, uh, for the next presentation, I'm going to invite Peter Bram at home to introduce the speaker and the, the subject. Peter Bram. Yes, thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Martin Ingvar. He is professor in neurophysiology in Karolinska Institute. And he is one of the pioneers of um, making a care path interoperable. And that means that he uses their technology actually to enhance the interaction between a healthcare provider and the patient, and also uses that same technology to actually measure the effectiveness of a treatment uh, that uh, the doctor and the patient decided on together. And that's quite unique in the world. Um, so I'm looking forward to this presentation. And um, Martin is also uh, the chair of ICOM, and you have heard about OMOP in the presentation about Darwin, and ICOM is actually another um, way uh, on how to standardize health observations. And the good thing is that when you have standardized all of this, that it is also um, be possible now to, to combine actually observations that are coded in OMOP and in ICOM. So the main message here is do standardize uh, and, and in the end, also uh, the different standards that are being used uh, are, are interoperable um, and can be made interoperable. So let's uh, watch the video uh, from Martin. He couldn't be here in person because he's traveling, although he, he was with us uh, in the, at the start of the meeting. Good afternoon. My name is Martin Ingmar. I'm very honored to be here. And today I'm going to talk about a large scale clinical uh, 
uh, application that we have done of, of fair principles. Uh, and to illustrate this, I will go through some of the prerequisites that we found on our way towards a real fair data type of clinical environment. So it's a real example that I'm talking about. Our vision is simple. We wanted to make sure to guarantee that patients actually knew what healthcare quality was delivered. And in order to do that, we need to measure it. And to measure it, we need to have interoperability of the data. But interoperability is a deep concept that spans uh, over several levels. So we need to work under the same laws and we need to remove technical barriers and we need to describe the data with a common understanding, i.e. a common language. And we need to do the same thing for different or, for, or the same thing for the same problems. Uh, fair data needs interoperability, as, as I said. So take the statement, this is a bog, and you immediately see that it can be understood in two different ways that in turn will lead to different decisions, which means that errors in communication propagate through the system. And when you communicate by electronic means, that means that you have no immediate receipt that it has been understood the same way uh, as you intended to. Hence, we need to take real care in order to, under, uh, to make sure that we actually understand the language the same way. In healthcare, we have dialects between different specialties, and we spent a lot of time uh, harmonizing the language across specialties because a patient doesn't only carry one diagnosis they often have many diagnoses and in order to meet that we need to meet, meet those different diagnoses with a common language so semantic interoperability uh, semantics is actually uh, just saying this is the meaning of the uh, words and the sentence Please observe that I'm also talking about the sentence, and the sentence could essentially be the same as a care pathway, because it holds semantic structure. It means something different if you take a blood pressure uh, right before uh, you are discharged from hospital versus if you come into the emergency room, for instance. So when recording a transaction, we need all the diff information around that recording in order to ca uh, capture the full semantic depth. Because the words, the terms, they only hold the definition of what and how. We also need to know who it pertains to, who, who, who is the patient and who is the, for instance, doctor. But we also need to know why and when, if we would like to make the data computable. And the CARE pathway carry that sort of information. <laughs> and timing is more than a timestamp. It's also the time from when we started the CARE pathway, but it's also in the CARE pathway, what, which one of the occasions it belongs to. If it belongs to the third doctor's visit, or if it belongs to the morning, report or if it uh, if it's a spontaneous occasion that means that the semantics uh, is encoded in two levels the level uh, of the vocabulary and the level of the care plan and very few EMR, emr systems can actually record that uh, they only record the vocabulary. The rest you have to, dis, uh, to do with what we call post annotation, which is laborious and very difficult to deal with. So we ended up with the following architecture. We separated the three stages, planning, capture, and analyze. And the planning stage where you where we include uh, laws and uh, national guidelines and uh, and uh, academic knowledge and what have you, so, uh, 
is then done by a local work group containing the representatives of patients, etc. Uh, and that is that does then provide the words that we're going to use and the care pathway that we are going to use. This gives us essentially a care plan that provides guided data capture. And that guided data capture then results in data that uh, can be recorded in a common data lake so rich in semantic knowledge that it can be used for multiple purposes, like for EMR, uh, for uh, dashboarding, for policy making, and for uh, uh, clinical data uh, measurements. It also supports a proper planning tool, so the work process can actually be represented in care, both for the patient and for healthcare. And uh, in that sense, it becomes a really deep service for healthcare to work in this way. <laughs> we are in the process of, of uh, refining our, uh, our patient app that allows a safe access for the patient to the care plan, i.e. not only what has happened in healthcare, but also what's planned for me in the same environment in an intuitive way. And we can actually improve the value for the patient by also included, uh, include, including uh, education. We can include from collection, etc. And the, for us, this means that it becomes an integrated part in healthcare, specifically in patients with chronic uh, ailments. So our conclusion is that the care pathway becomes a clinical decision support tool. We have a planned data matrix that gradually needs to be filled in order to provide the patient with the correct medical decisions and advice. In this way, it more or less standardizes the decision space that is used by all the profession. It becomes, <laughs> uh, you because become less dependent on a single doctor's decision uh, when you have this type, this type of, of uh, knowledge support for healthcare. So, uh, so far our 400 patients uh, have, uh, we have the conclusion that they have received a higher standard of care the number of exacerbations of disease have decreased, including hospitalization as compared uh, with the previous. Uh, and we note that the patient involvement has increased. The, the evaluation of uh, medical compliance to advice and pharma, uh, pharmacological tools is underway. But we have now demonstrated that we can uh, use the data for multiple purposes, quality register, EMR, different statistical purposes, uh, and clinical research. And uh, for us, this is uh, really important since we are an academic uh, clinical center. All data are fair by annotation, and fair means that uh, we exactly know what they mean since they are so richly annotated and they can be harvested by algorithm we never have to leave the data for some to somebody else we can always just give the group level data by this type of uh, architecture that we have built in uh, so thank you very much for listening and uh, this paper is the uh, description of uh, of what we have done uh, in a way where we can, where we describe the semantic prerequisites that we have had to fulfill in order to be able to deliver uh, the the remote access type of data from directly from healthcare. Thank you very much for listening.
So, Peter Bram, I could uh, invite you again to wrap up uh, after such a wonderful webinar. And also, Dimitrios, I know you're there. Hey, I can see you. Hello, Dimitrios. <laughs> so, the Hello. floor is. Yes, so Dimitrios and, my, and myself have um, prepared a few uh, last questions. Uh, but um, yeah, in looking back at this afternoon, I think we have seen, uh, first of all, great examples of everything that's going on uh, within. Uh, the patient communities and around the patient communities. And uh, we see really things coming together in, in these times, and, and that's really good to see. Um, I would like to thank all the participants, first of all, for staying with us. And there is still the opportunity to uh, put any questions in, uh, in the box uh, with Q&A. So feel free to, uh, to submit your questions, and we'll try to get back to them uh, in this webinar or maybe uh, even after the webinar. Um, so let, we started the, off this afternoon with this a very nice video recording of a Duchenne patient, Lisette. Um, and um, what she mentioned in her video was actually that she was, of course, wanting to altruistically contribute her data, but also had an interest in finding out more about her disease herself and also about uh, other patients uh, with um, uh, her disease. And, and I feel that that aspect has been a little underemphasized in, in the presentations that we saw in the late afternoon. So I have a few questions, or um, Dimitrios and I have a few questions for the presenters in this last session, uh, starting with uh, Jerome. Um, so, uh, in this European health data space, you clearly mentioned the empowerment of patients, but mainly in the primary care process and not so much in the secondary use of data. So the question that Lisette asked, uh, how can I know more about the, the, the development of my disease, for example, how uh, will EHDS empower her uh, asking that type of questions? Can you say something on that? No, thank you. For, thank you for the question. So I think when it comes to, to secondary use, where we see the empowerment is thirst by the purposes really being focused on benefiting them. So the idea is that only access to the, the, the access to data is linked to whatever research question being proposed, showing benefit for the patients. And part secondly is the series of provisions that we put when it comes to the publication of on the activities of the health data access bodies, but also on the results from projects that ought to be supported. So, so, so this is how we, we really see them benefiting uh, directly from uh, when it comes to secondaries of, uh, of EHDS really. Um, yes, I think that's as far as you can go. Thank you, thank you, Jerome. Uh, I think this is very clear. I really wonder if we're talking about publication of negative results also. I assume that the answer is yes. Yes. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm passing to Daniel. Daniel, I know that there has been a lot of work uh, inside the MA about uh, the data, the real world deficits, etc. My question is, we have experienced in the past that the machinery or the tools that we're building for, uh, let's say, big population diseases don't fit for purpose for rare diseases. And uh, having said that, uh, what about patient reported outcomes? What is the role of the patient organizations in the, inside the effort that you are doing? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, with regards to Darwin, um, it is something that we will, you know, that patient reported outcomes and data is certainly on the cards in that respect. Um, at the moment, we're still early days in the onboarding processes. Um, and we're also guided by the types of questions that are coming through the committees. Now, many of the committees also have patient representat representatives on that to influence that process as well. So it, it, it really depends on that. Now, we envisage that the vision is to have all singing or dancing fit for, for full purpose and we can integrate. I think we're a number of years away, you know, to really establish that. And we certainly need, you know, the sort of work that's already happening with your own registry initiatives that we've heard about here to develop and mature as well. 
Um, and certainly, I think something like the EHDS will help to sort of coalesce and bring that together as well. So, um, you know, I, I think right now, um, in regards to Darwin, it's, it, uh, there isn't a patient reported outcome database that has already been onboarded. It's very early, but that isn't the only other, uh, the only avenue. If there are specific questions that need that type of data that are not available in that, in that process, then we have the framework contracts where we can go a lot more specific, a lot more, you know, that, that actually may be better for some of the rare disease questions and registries if needed. So we have multiple avenues. Thank you, thank you very much, Daniel. Peter Bram. Yes, uh, Anna had to leave as well, but we have Anna version 2.0 with us in the form of Yanis. So I'm going to di direct uh, this question to Yanis as well. So um, I'm, I'm still here, Peter Bram. Oh, she's sure? still here, she's still oh, here. We have them both. I will, so Anna or Yanis, please. Uh, oh, yes. Um, <laughs> fill each other in then. Um, great that you're still here. Um, so, um, with regard to the development of the virtual platform, we have seen actually that the Duchenne and uh, the other plus form was the first patient driven registry to be um, connected uh, to the virtual platform. So, we are still very proud of that. Um, but, um, what about patients directly interacting with the virtual platform? How do you see a future uh, for that? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I expected that question. Uh, uh, so, uh, so first of all, I think, uh, and Yanis can complete on that, one of the main, let's say, philosophical pillars of uh, the EJPRD is to have the patients at the center of, uh, of uh, research. So not only, uh, not only participating, not only being informed, not only bringing data, but being um, uh, partners in, in rare disease research. Uh, at the first level of um, discoverability and, 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 and queryability, uh, that will be open to everybody. So it's not, not uh, limits. Uh, for, so the accessing um, uh, the virtual platform through the portal. Uh, then um, uh, I think that uh, that uh, the patients could, as researchers can, um, make more in-depth queries provided. The, the, so the, the restrictions that are at the resource ends are not at the virtual platform ends. So um, what we what we intend to do is to respect everybody in the network. Uh, the conditions that the different uh, uh, nodes in the network will 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 pose, and uh, if the researcher is a consortium of patients and researchers, or of patients wanting to access or to contact the resources that they have discovered through the virtual platform, I think the virtual platform will facilitate that, and there is no putting any barrier on the contrary for patients. I, I, I can add also that uh, in the plan that we have, we are designing a training that is both a MOOC and also uh, in-person training, hybrid training that will be in-person online, where the patients are at the heart also. So the MOOC will be also considered for uh, lay um, IT uh, stakeholders including some patients, although we have, we know that we have patients who are really skilled uh, uh, for that. Uh, yes, and the MOOC is for massive, massive online um, uh, open course. So it will help in mastering the virtual platform, how we can use it, how we can search and fine tune, but also there will be a part that is dedicated to developers where we envisage that some resources that are developed by patients, such as the Duchenne Data Platform, will also benefit from that MOOC in order to connect and further uh, um, uh, uh, develop functionalities that will benefit through the connection of the virtual platform. And of course, uh, uh, Peter Brum, as you know, we are uh, establishing, as Anna said, because the patient is at the, at, at the heart, we are, we, we, we are establishing the use case uh, methodology. So some use cases who are defined also by, by patients are also listed and then activated in order to develop a specific functionality. You will see also uh, after the release of the first version of the virtual platform, you will you have a link for a, a feedback where the patient will be able to submit any idea they would like the virtual platform to serve. So 
in addition to other uh, other categories. So suppose that uh, a patient would like to have, uh, and Anna, I am maybe anticipating to have a search functionality on uh, on uh, on a patient reported outcome, for example, or to know where they can find them and what is fit for them. Then it is possible also to submit that questions that will be added in our backlog and then considered for development with yeah. the involvement of the different patients for testing and validation. Yeah, yeah, it's a, that I, I don't want to be long on that, but um, uh, as I said before, we are uh, so collaborating with Erika project that is the so the, the project on uh, re year-end research activities. Uh, I am fortunately co-leading the, the, the work package on the patient reported outcomes, uh, so patient, patient center research there. And we have built a repository that is a living one on PCOMs and PROMs uh, that are um, either developed for specific rare diseases, either used for specific rare diseases already, and or uh, addressing some uh, functional domains that are important for rare diseases. So I hope I am, and, and we will do that. Uh, uh, is that this repository is also linked at, uh, to the virtual platform uh, at the end? But we are so that uh, the, the first version was um, was published in the summer. So uh, please uh, do, uh, do not hesitate. I will copy the link here. And, and so you can, you can also see that. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you so much. Marco, very quickly. Yes, yes. You, you can hear me? Yeah? Yes. So yeah, I just wanted to, to, to uh, well, second everything that Anna and Yanni said, obviously. But I, I, I'm thinking back of the, the, the session we had in the beginning of the day where we discussed that maybe there's there's questions to uh, that we should that we can start focusing on questions rather than on on getting the data and uh, that yeah i got the idea that maybe uh, also looking at Denise Elana and Peter Brum in maybe in a kind of workshop setting online workshop we can have we can have a session where we get questions from patient representatives and then see how we can answer them mark wilkinson showed his demo um, so we can also have some people who can actually translate human questions into machine questions and then see what we can do with the problems and the data and the common data elements, et cetera. So maybe we can take it one step further and plan something in a workshop setting. I like uh, future steps and fast steps. Uh, Leon, how do you survive your arguments about prompts and how important are for you know development and care since we have every stakeholder here? Uh, because but, uh, I know that we are facing troubles in the ERNs, you know, about the value of prompts, and I'm very happy that you're here. Oh, well, I think prompts are absolutely essential, yeah? And of course, let's say the, the, the real data from the, the electronic health records are important, but you need to combine that with, with how patients feel about their condition and, and the disease and how they experience the treatment itself. So that's just as important. So I think prompts is really an essential part of it, yeah? Uh, but again, like I said, there are many prompts out there. Uh, most of them are not usable. And I think the worst idea would be to develop our own prompts because it will take you years before you basically you got it validated. So we need to look around what, what is usable. And then the second part is again for the disease specific part, we need to develop each ERN need to develop its own prompts and they need to validate it, but it's still a long process. But needed process, I would say, because I see Daniel uh, moving his head, you know, that's a very much needed process in all regulatory work also. Uh, Peter, I need the last minute, so you have one more minute from your side. No, so I'm, I'm, I'm also going to say a few final words here uh, before I give over to you then. Um, so um, I was actually um, I'm learning a lot myself in this meeting, so it was very information dense, I think. Um, luckily, we still have a recording, so we can uh, watch back. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, uh, it is clear that there is a lot going on and that this uh, this meeting is also very important to, to bring all the stakeholders together. It was mentioned a number of times in the meeting uh, that, that we should all collaborate and, and um, all our activities should be uh, coordinated as well as possible. And, and a meeting like uh, this afternoon also helps um, uh, to coordinate. Um, so the onboarding process of, of um, newcomers in the field is still a big uh, concern, I think, and also there we should really collaborate to, to um, well, 
um, have more people uh, jump on the train and to uh, to go a bit slower maybe than we did today uh, so that they are really able to catch that train um, and uh, I think uh, we will uh, have more of these meetings uh, needed to to make um, it possible for person uh, patient organizations and patients to jump on the, on the train and uh, so that's what we are going to do in the near future and I guess you are going to thank then uh, the organizers of today so I'll leave that to you uh, Anita. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Peter. I, I think that we have to thank uh, more than uh, you know the organizers of the event. Uh, I have to say, and uh, I'm sure that Elizabeth, uh, let's say, will agree with me. You know, we, we moved a lot the last period, the last uh, not a lot of years. You know, from uh, sitting on a table considering, oh, fair, yeah, fantastic, let's do it, than where we are now. Uh, as uh, Jorgo said in the in the previous in the closure of the previous session. Uh, how do we prove to others that you know what that we can do better? I think uh, with a fantastic regulation, 20 years old, and something like 170 products for rare diseases, for eight, six to eight thousand rare diseases, definitely we can do better. And as a proof of concept, uh, I think it's proven. Uh, we have seen it. We have seen it happening. We have seen it happening now. Rianen. We are uh, looking forward to connect and push it beyond, let's say, the neuromuscular. Uh, it works and it works good. It's the heart of the European Joint Program. It's the heart in uh, in EU projects. So fair is there. I think the next uh, mountain is uh, is closing by, but we have a great crew. Uh, hopefully, we all be together to manage this. And a, a very big special thanks, you know, to all the people that are joined and started this uh, project and this program. You know, we know that you all worked many hours beyond schedule, like today, knowing that's beyond Dusan. And thank you for that. And a very special thanks to Navelle that make this happen, all the work that uh, she, uh, let's say, included in this and faith to us. And Suzanne, thank you for managing uh, such a tricky and very speedy session. Thank you for the participation. Thank you all of us for all your effort. And I think we're going to meet again pretty soon, preparing for the next mountain, right? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.